Welcome again. Uh, my name is uh, Agnes Kovács. I work um, at CEU in Budapest, and uh, it is my great honor to open uh, the Think Big Symposium that is in honor of uh, Schad Miller. I'm very happy that uh, we are so many of us here. I hope you can all hear me well. And um, I'm very happy that besides the conference participants, we are also having uh, with us some of uh, Jacques' uh, lifelong friends and uh, collaborators, just to mention a couple of people who, whose names I happen to spot before I started uh, sharing my screen. For instance, we have here Marina Nespo, Nuria Sebastian Gallez, Alda Laburda, John Morton, Dick Aslin, uh, Tom Bevers, and uh, some of uh, Jacques uh, former students from Paris and Trieste. So, and of course the conference participants, welcome everyone. Um, uh, Jacques probably doesn't need much of an introduction as he is one of the uh, uh, founding fathers of cognitive science, he can be seen like that. And he is also, we know his work and his research um, from, um, uh, from the Paris Baby Lab and uh, Paris uh, Lab for Cognitive Science and Psycholinguistics, uh, for which he established and he was a director and a collaborator for many years. And we also know his work um, uh, that he has done in the Trieste Baby Lab, uh, which he established in 2001. And he was a, di a director of it until uh, 2016 when he retired. Uh, what we can also mention uh, um, is that he, many of us might know him as he was uh, the co-founder and uh, um, the editor of Cognition for many, many years. And uh, of course, uh, not to mention his uh, innovative research that uh, most cognitive scientists, uh, people interested in language acquisition and developmental scientists are very much familiar with. So as... Um, a very short uh, look to his uh, to his uh, scientific family tree. What I wanted to uh, mention very briefly that he has as mentors George Miller, uh, Noam Chomsky, and Jean Piaget. And of course, he was the mentor of many, many students as postdocs, and uh, which uh, are more than 40, and some of them you see in, in this slide. However, some of them are missing from here. And what I also wanted to mention, something which is also even more interesting, that the students of Jacques, of course, at their times have mentored other students and other postdocs. So actually, Jacques' um, uh, family tree is really huge, so huge that it doesn't fit in, uh, in this slide. So uh, the aim of this symposium is by no means to assess in any way uh, the scientific achievement of Jacques, uh, at least for two reasons. And one of these reasons is, of course, that in two hours, this is by no being possible. And the second reason is that I think that he would not really like that. So I think that uh, those of you who have known him might agree that he would much more like uh, some kind of personal discussion, some kind of discussion about big theoretical issues or any kind of discussion he would have preferred over to some kind of uh, evaluation of his own work. Therefore, in this short symposium, which will last about two hours, this is what we will, uh, we will try to do. And I will start with, um, with a personal note. So um, what I think that one of the greatest feats of a researcher is not only doing uh, innovative research, but also to um, mentor young students and novices uh, to strive to find big questions and to strive to do innovative research and to show them how to think and how to find uh, interesting questions. And um, just, um, uh, I want to mention in one minute my personal story. So when I was um, a third year student, uh, Jacques came to me and said, well, you know, Aggie, uh, what we have done till now together for your PhD, it's really interesting, but um, I'm not really sure where it leads. So maybe you should start thinking of some uh, new questions. So when I heard that, of course, I was not uh, super happy about that. And I wouldn't say that the period that followed that uh, was very easy because what happened was the following. Every week for several 
uh, weeks or even months, what I did, I went to Jacques with a kind of half-baked idea and I explained this idea to him and he would say things like, well, this is interesting, but let's think more. Or he would say, oh, this was done more than 20 years ago. Or he would say, oh yes, that's a research question, but why should one do that? What does it tell us about the human mind? And uh, this went on and on until a moment when I went off with a question to which he said, hmm, well, let's talk about it. And then uh, discussion followed and then uh, uh, this whole process turned out in some very nice studies. And uh, looking now back, I think it was really important in my scientific career because I learned what is, I think, most important for a scientist is how to ask uh, interesting questions. Um, so with this, um, I will turn to the symposium of today, and uh, this is the, the schedule what you have what you see here, and um, we will have uh, some um, uh, twenty minutes talks by two of uh, Jacques' uh, lifelong collaborators, Luca Bonatti and Marcela Peña, who has started working with Jacques uh, while he was in Paris and continued uh, uh, in, during his time in Trieste, which I think uh, overlaps more than. 20 years or even more maybe. And this will be uh, Luca Bonatti's talk and Marcela Peña's talk. Then this will be followed by some short talks by Amanda Shakshida, Alan Langus, Anna Flo, and Silvia Benavidas, who were drug students in Trieste. And then we will have a couple of flash talks by Judith Gerva and Juan Matoro, Jeremy Hockman. And finally, we'll have a nice closure by Tom Bever, if all will work, who was a co-founder of Cognition with Jack together. And of course, we will, um, uh, open the, in the end, we can have some personal remarks from uh, from uh, from uh, anyone from the audience who wish to add some thoughts. And in the end, we will have a Think Big Jacques Miller Prize, which uh, will go to uh, an innovative uh, student presentation at this conference. What I forgot to mention, which the, the participants at the conference know, is that uh, we are recording this session, so participants should be aware of this. And now we will start and I give the floor over to Luca Bonatti. I will stop sharing my slides now. With okay, thank you very much. I think uh, you should be able to see my my present my screen and hear my voice. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So I can start. So, uh, Agri, thank you very much. You were very kind to introduce Jacques. I have to say that uh, to me it's difficult to give this talk. First, because it's one year I haven't given a talk because of the reasons that you might imagine. Second, because it's a talk about Jacques, so it, it, it was very difficult for me to just uh, um, sort of decide what to say and how to say it. So I'll try and see what, uh, uh, what comes out of it. Uh, some of the uh, things that I'm going to present uh, include, um, include uh, uh, work that has been done by a lot of people. I will focus mostly on uh, the persons who um, um, uh, are part of the so-called Trieste group. As uh, Aggie said, uh, Jacques was an incredibly good uh, mentor and uh, he was able to forge groups, uh, which became groups of friends for the rest of life and still are. So uh, that's what I'm focusing a little more, what I know most, which is uh, uh, the group of Trieste. And I have to say these two people, of the people that I'm mentioning here, two of them, uh, um, Unfortunately, now with us, one is Jacques and the other one is Erika Marchetto, who was also a student at, uh, uh, in Trieste and unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Okay, so uh, what, uh, what to, did I try to... I realized I have, don't have many pictures, actually I have zero pictures of Jacques because he was like one of my family. Uh, I don't have pictures of my parents, I never took pictures of my parents, why should have I? And so, uh, I never took pictures of Jacques, so that's what uh, the way we remember him at the Trieste conference uh, when the laboratory was closed. Um, uh, it appears that uh, uh, when I met him, I'm actually here uh, and I'm giving this talk not because of scientific excellence, uh, but because of seniority. And uh, uh, the reason is that uh, uh, among the persons who today uh, give uh, uh, their talk, 
I am the one who uh, knew Jacques first, uh, if I uh, am not uh, wrong. So when I met Jacques, he was by and large like that. Uh, and uh, that was in the um, late 80s, uh, early 90s. I was a student uh, at uh, Rutgers at the time. I just was about to finish my PhD and Jacques offered me to, uh, to go to, uh, to Paris to become an engineer. I was a philosopher. That made my mother happy, but uh, there was no particular reason to, to go there, except that he was a great guy and I had just followed the class uh, by him, which was a great class. And uh, um, uh, at the time, I have, there was no Marie Curie. I was the corresponding uh, uh, person. Uh, uh, I had this human capital and mobility, very awful name. Uh, 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 fellowship and uh, uh, in Trieste, I was given the to the job of interest. So in Paris, I was given the job of essentially learning what psychology is about. And Jacques uh, um, started. The, so I went to my computer and I started organizing the the uh, uh, the files that I have. I don't have all of my life. I leave some of the uh, pleasure to the biographers, but I do have some of them. And this is. The first uh, file that I found that I sent to him, uh, and uh, um, it's about um, uh, 1991, something like that. And I just want to show you that it is uh, a, a seven pages file. And that there might be things in this file that you might see as uh, uh, appearing uh, uh, in your life later, like tier of mind concept. This was a, a review for cognition, and it was a seven-page review. And uh, it was a seven-page review of probably a paper which was like a 70 uh, or 700 pages. I, I have always pictured Jacques being in his office in cognition at the time. He would receive the manuscript. It looked, every day it looked like Christmas. There was these big things coming by mail. And he had a scale, essentially, mental scale, but he had a scale. He would put the, the, uh, the heaviest papers on the scale and he would give them to me as a review. And uh, so I was uh, reciprocating with so, such a long review that at a certain point he stopped giving them to me. And uh, um, this is the first message that I found of him and I wanted to show it to you because it's so typical of Jacques that I couldn't resist. Um, um, he just communicates to me that he had attended a meeting at the school and he communicates to me that uh, I am going to teach a class on reasoning the year after uh, it's not that he asked me anything, he just uh, gave me a class to teach. And he also tells me, which is very French and very nice, that uh, they said, okay, and that this is necessary because he wanted me to enter uh, uh, the school. And so he said that, uh, uh, you know, uh, to become a teacher, I had to do it. And of course, uh, uh, I was not being paid. So I was, I received the message, which I knew, one, that he wanted me in the school, two, that I had to teach a class, three, that they wouldn't get money. Okay, that's, that was live with him. That was part of uh, a campaign that he launched to have me at the school. Um, uh, the campaign ended with a vote in which uh, uh, Jacques was very satisfied of the outcome. I obtained three votes out of 112, I think. And he was very happy because uh, there were uh, at least uh, the 50% of votes more than what he had expected to get for me. And that's the way it ended. Now, um, um, after this Paris period, the, uh, oh yeah, these are other files uh, that tell you a little about what was happening at this time. This is a file of the oldest files. You can see maybe some of you who work see things that uh, um, you know uh, stayed with us for many, many years, bugs in SciScope that occupies a lot of my hard drive, uh, but also things about logic, logical connectives, uh, mental logic and lang language of thought, logical form, and things about reasoning, lots of fights about reasoning in the period in which I was in, uh, in, uh, in Paris and later on in Trieste. And uh, um, so why was I, was I doing these things? Because as you know, Jacques is mostly remembered for his work uh, uh, on language. Uh, if you look at his, uh, uh, at his production here, um, this is uh, the Google uh, Scholar um, uh, list of the most quoted papers, and they're mostly all of them about language. You cannot find much about reasoning. However, that's not exactly the full uh, 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 representation of what Jack uh, uh, had in his mind. Um, most of you will, will know about this picture. This represents, this is not a paper written by Jacques. 
It is a paper which appeared, it's a little note which appeared in the MIT Technology Review, which was explaining what uh, 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 Meller and Bever had uh, found. And there is an interesting issue, uh, quotes here, see how they present their results. Um, um, do children possess an inherent capacity for logical thought or do they acquire it by their experience of the world? And what they argue is that uh, the paper by Miller and Bever uh, showed that uh, uh, children had uh, an inherent capacity for logical thought. Now, interestingly, the paper, this is not the, 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 the phrasing that you can find in the paper, but this is the way it was perceived. And I think in part, uh, this was uh, um, um, also how Jacques perceived what he was doing. He was very interested in thinking processes. Now, at that time, uh, I think people had a very vague idea what uh, thought could be, what reasoning could be, and I think part of the progress is there. But the main point is that, um, you know, we are here with many of the problems that were in Jacques' mind when I met him. And um, uh, how did the Trieste group was born? Well, the Trieste group was born after a conference that Jacques organized together with me uh, and Susan Carey. What a beautiful uh, group of organizers take away me. And there were participants who were all extremely good and, uh, and some of them you will, you will recognize them. Uh, some of them are also collaborators of some of the current work that I'm doing here. And uh, um, it was Jacques who finally decided what program this conference had to be, had to, had to have. And it started with the work on language and language acquisition. And then quickly it went on cognitive development with uh, Susan and Liz Pecke. And then it went uh, on uh, some uh, ending part uh, with uh, uh, about logic and semantic with uh, uh, Bonatti and uh, Gennaro Kierke, who are now collaborators uh, on topics which have to do with logic and semantics. Uh, so that was to show you that Jacques' centers of interest could perhaps shown, be shown in this way. He was very interested in how humans speak, what their biology allows them to master a language and how language is acquired, what exactly is acquired. Jacques was uh, essentially a functionalist. Uh, so he didn't like brain per se, but he did like every information about the brain that could tell us something about the representation. And I want to point at the fact that these questions uh, can be paired with other questions like how can human think? What in their biology allows humans to have thoughts and how thought is acquired, if it is acquired, and what exactly is acquired where, uh, if uh, anything is acquired when you, are, when you learn how to think, if anything you learn. And I want to just point at the fact that there is some sort of parallel that I wanted to, the reason why these two questions were in, in Jack's mind, although yeah, we know him mostly for what is in, on the top part, can be sort of understood if you consider uh, Wittgenstein centers of interest. Wittgenstein was, was fascinated, the first Wittgenstein, by how come that we have, can have a record or we can have something printed and that there is a level at which these devices, which are physically completely different, express something which is the same thing? And the answer he had was, well, they're shared the logical form. And uh, the same questions could be considered in, in Jacques' uh, mind in the following ways. Imagine somebody who thinks and somebody who speaks. And somebody could look at the world and say, okay, I have not seen a pair, I actually have seen an echo, but there are corresponding thoughts that whose format we don't know, which could be, I don't know, images, it could be mental models, it could be sentences in a language of thought, uh, which do correspond uh, to something that we can express with thought. And the point here is that uh, language and thought um, um, share something, I would say they share something similar to the logical form in the sense of Wittgenstein, but that's why if one is interested in one, he or she is also interested in the other one. So what I want to uh, tell you in these very few minutes is um, just make some statements really rather than a presentation, and it is uh, uh, about uh, the progress of these two sets of questions that were in Jacques and in our minds when, when I met him uh, at the beginning. One has to do with the bulk of the work on the biology uh, of language and its mechanism. Do we know something more about it in, in, in these years? I mean, of course, what uh, I present is not just uh, um, uh, the work of Jack, but I want to point at how much uh, the group that he made in Trieste contributed to this work. Well, 
I think we can say, and I think it, it is uncontroversial, that uh, there is brain tissue which is dedicated to speech processing at birth, and uh, even before birth, uh, the work by Marcella Peña, Judy Gervin, uh, uh, Gislaine Dehan, and other people who were uh, some of his uh, uh, students. I think we can also claim that uh, 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 the infant's brain is not just sensitive to language structure on the basis of, uh, uh, of indices that uh, uh, it can be found in the signal, uh, by well pros of the indices of segmentation. Um, uh, so it's not just that infants look for words, they actually look for structure in, uh, in language. And uh, uh, I mentioned here all the people who were in Trieste and who I think contributed to uh, clarify this issue. And perhaps the most uh, controversial one is there are a multiplicity of acquisition mechanisms which uh, uh, might be responsible for language acquisition. And uh, many of us try to argue for this, uh, uh, for this claim uh, uh, as well. Um, um, just very quickly, you remember this was the very first paper that uh, uh, gave some indication about uh, the presence of, uh, uh, um, of uh, uh, brain tissue dedicated to processing language at birth uh, in, uh, with a method that he, uh, with the Kassling, contributed to develop and is with us in these days, uh, uh, Nier's, uh, Nier's work. And, uh, um, and that established uh, to my uh, feeling that uh, uh, there is indeed uh, um, uh, special uh, tissue that treats language very early on. Indeed, we know even before birth, and this is the work that has been done also by uh, um, uh, the group of Gislaine Dehan uh, um, as a with another technique, uh, um, experimental technique, but with the same kind of result. Okay, so I think that this is uncontroversial. It's a little more controversial what happens in the mechanism that uh, are being used uh, in language acquisition. Uh, you know that uh, the full literature change by, by when, when uh, Safran, Newport, and Aslin uh, uh, showed that, that uh, uh, infants and adults are very sensitive to uh, information which has to do with the transitional probabilities uh, connected to uh, syllables, that uh, connect syllables. However, we, uh, so the idea that was presented is that uh, uh, the statistical computation is much stronger than what uh, uh, people, uh, we, we think or what people thought before. Uh, and there is possibly all what there is in, uh, in acquisition. Uh, we do know, and this is also work that has been done by the Trieste group, that that fits some languages and not others. So for example, by work of Amanda Saxida and uh, Marina Nespor and Anna Langus work here, uh, we do know that uh, uh, transitional adjacent, at least adjacent transitional probabilities are a good cue for segmentation in some languages such as English, but very poor in, uh, in, in languages uh, such as Hungarian or Polish. So maybe that's not so, uh, so uh, in universal as, uh, um, um, as a cue as one would like. Uh, and we try to argue that there is much more than that in a paper that didn't have a great fortune, I would say, uh, because it was somewhat, uh, uh, the paper was essentially claiming that uh, there are two at least fundamental uh, questions in language, how we discover words in a continuous speech, how we discover rules underlying words, and, and that there are different kinds of computations that are uh, being uh, uh, used to process, to solve these two problems. One is indeed compute probabilities, but the other one is somewhat guess some sort of rule. Um, this, um, this really was not uh, uh, really well received. Uh, it was, didn't convince many people. So for example, this is a quote by uh, Dick Kasslin and Lisa Newport in, uh, in a summary of this work, in which essentially what was being suggested is that this idea that there are uh, uh, different mechanisms uh, might not hold and uh, um, um, might uh, a single uh, mechanism story can be, uh, can be um, uh, supported. However, we also know now by uh, a considerable amount of work, some of which has been done uh, in Trieste by the group of Trieste, uh, that uh, there is evidence that infants and adults uh, do uh, seem to have to, to, to process different kinds of computations in the brain when, uh, when they are trying to extract words or when they are trying to extract rules out of a speech stream. So I, 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 would, I would claim that at least for the first part of Jack's interests, um, um, there is some considerable progress and consensus which have been 
uh, achieved uh, on the basic uh, um, ideas, uh, basic tenets that Jacques held. I think he was mostly right in what, uh, what he proposed. How about what we know about humans? Well, there uh, we, we know very little still, and uh, that's, I think, where the action that is uh, that I'm, what I'm trying to do in my little uh, attempts to, to, to make this progress uh, uh, occupies my time. Uh, there has been progress there uh, in our understanding of the relation between thought and language, and that came mostly uh, well, much research, but also by a clarification of the role of logic in language. And what has been shown, and I refer particularly to the work of uh, Gennaro Kierkia, who is the person that I uh, am mostly um, uh, exchanging with, and the only one who bears me when I say things that are very difficult uh, um, to understand, uh, because they are badly expressed. Um, so uh, there is a considerable linguistic evidence that uh, 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 implication patterns and logical relations uh, are more important in language. They are lexicalized. They are even grammaticalized. Uh, uh, so, for example, lexical some some lexical items is strictly ungrammatical if it is expressed in contexts which are uh, which don't have the proper uh, uh, semantical implications. So you, you can say, um, is there anybody here? But uh, uh, you cannot answer there is anybody here. And uh, we know that uh, uh, even when there are no lexical items which are connected to, uh, to linguistic uh, um, uh, production, direct production, there, is, there are good evidence of intuitions of uh, um, um, patterns of implication, or the fact that there are uh, upward versus downward context and the, uh, kind, the kinds of uh, uh, implications that hold in one, they don't hold in the other. So I think that the point is we now have the possibility to, uh, to, to focus much better in, on the question of the relation between the conceptual system and uh, uh, language. And, uh, and there is possibly the, now the possibility to advance on these topics by studying how they do interfaces. Um, what did I do? What did we do in, in the group of people who most worked with me to advance on this topic? Well, we took the worst approach, the, most, the longest and the more painful, which has been to study uh, what kind of logical abilities might exist uh, uh, before language uh, is available uh, to infants in a productive way. So we tried to transform some of the uh, linguistic and logical patterns of integration that we know exist in language into some non-verbal scene, and we try to find behavioral and neural markers that uh, uh, um, show that these inferences are made. And from there, our aim is to understand how, whether if we are right that these patterns and, uh, and these markers reveal the existence of logical thought, they percolate into our uh, uh, little words and of, uh, or if, then, and so on. Uh, our main work, and I try to just present it very briefly, is uh, uh, work which has to do with a very single uh, um, 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 pattern of inference, uh, disjunctive elimination. And the idea here is to transform uh, linguistic inferences pattern in, in a verbal scene by maintaining this fact that if in thought you have logical forms and inferences, so you must have, uh, when you represent, just as Vicky and I wanted, uh, some scene of the world which expresses the same content. And the basic idea that we had is this one. You have, if you have two objects and you represent them, and there is a moment in which one of these is hidden in such a way that you cannot determine which one it is, um, uh, perhaps you present a, a logical representation of this scene. Like there is an A or a B, or there is a, a, an umbrella or a, or a boy in this, uh, in this uh, uh, cup, or uh, I don't know what there is, something which has a logical form. From there, other information can allow you to deduce that because you have seen one object in one uh, position and now we know that the other object, although you have never seen it, cannot be there, you conclude that uh, the other object uh, is uh, the flower, in this case, is in, the, is in, the, in, this, uh, uh, in this cup. Um, let me just show you very briefly. So what we try to do is to go through this potential representation of the scene and uh, piece by piece uh, reconstruct the, uh, the kind of uh, uh, um, uh, markers that can mark the existence of logical inferences and logical representations. Uh, we are now using scenes like this one, which, is, which are slightly different, but the idea is the following. I, I just present them because they, they present the, the, um, 
the results that I'm presenting now. So you see now you have a situation which you don't know, that what we call the logical scene. And now we have a situation which disambiguates what there is in this, in this cup. So uh, a, a, a logical representation moment and the logical inference moment. We can think around these situations by creating other ways in which an object is unknown. So for example, uh, in this case, the object is unknown. Look at this little grass that grows. Uh, but it will remain unknown because when it gets out, it's outside, it, it's behind the, uh, the grass. Or else we can uh, uh, present the very same thing, but now we have seen the object inside the cup. So whether the object is visible in the moment of the, uh, of the inference or is, or is not visible, like for example, in this case, when it goes uh, behind this grass, that's not important. The situation is always the same. Uh, uh, participants will know uh, the uh, identity of the object inside the cup. So we can compare unknown and known situations. And uh, what we are doing now, this is the work that we did previously and was published in a paper in Science some years ago. We tracked whether there are markers of differences in inference, but we can also expand this work and ask, okay, can we show that logical representations have different markers with respect to inferences? And the answer is essentially yes. Uh, for uh, I'm presenting here work on pupil dilation in adults and in 12 month old infants with the scenes they just presented you. This is the moment of the inference and what we can see in both situations that both adults and infants have higher pupil dilation when an object is unknown, uh, suggesting that uh, uh, there is some sort of processing which is different uh, when you can identify an object and when you cannot identify an object. Um, we now have evidence that uh, we are analyzing now about uh, in adults, at least uh, the brain representation of this moment. And what uh, is interesting here is that uh, some parts of, there is a part of the network which is involved, which is very frontal, that seems to code for the presence of unknown, uh, unknown objects. Not only that, it's distributed, but it's there. And then we can also map, which we hadn't done before, the moment of logical representations. And what you can see here is this moment, and the moment in which therefore uh, an object uh, goes uh, um, uh, outside uh, the, um, um, sorry, the moment in which the, 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 the uh, participants cannot know what there is in, in, uh, in, uh, in a cup. And what we see th there is that in uh, pupil dilation, in both in infants and adults, there is the same marker of work of thought of uh, effort that seem to suggest that the underlying representation uh, of a known and unknown object is different. Uh, you can compare, we also have data about uh, uh, the brain representation of these nonverbal scenes in adults. And what you can see also uh, very briefly, and here I rely on my collaborators who know more about the brain than I do, is that uh, uh, it looks like uh, this is what happens when uh, uh, this is the, the, the structure of the brain uh, when, uh, uh, when uh, participants, adults, see uh, an uh, unknown um, um, object compared to the known condition. And this is the, the, the brain representation of uh, the inference that uh, moment that I presented you before. And what you can see here is that it looks like some, the brain, some sort of the same areas sort of switch their role. And uh, uh, those which are active in the moment of the logical representation become essentially inactive in the moment in which uh, an inference can be made and therefore their role as it were is not needed any longer. Okay, so I think we are trying to uh, somewhat uh, um, uh, follow the path of a reasoning uh, before uh, the moment in which uh, uh, people um, uh, have to express these thoughts verbally. I, am, uh, I want to mention that we are doing the same kind of work in 12 months old infants uh, uh, together with Anna Martin and Judith Gervain, and we will soon have uh, the results. Uh, but there is a possible interpretation which is completely different, and it is the following. Suppose that we are completely wrong, and suppose that when people see these scenes, they represent scenes, uh, um, objects, so they have an object representation, but in the moment in which there is what we call the unknown, that there is never such a logical form of uh, A or B or uh, an unknown X, which is represented. People don't know what there is. What do they do? Well, they bet. They always keep in their mind one single object, a concrete one, with, without ever 
uh, constructing something which has logical valence in terms of the representation. That has been claimed by uh, a recent paper by Lehi and Susan Carey. And the idea there is that then when uh, the scene con con continues, uh, uh, participants only track objects and use their object tracking system to determine, uh, to, to make a representation of the scene. There is no need of logic for, for, this, uh, uh, for this explanation. I want to finish to show you how we are trying to address this kind of alternative hypothesis. We say that uh, we are wrong, that there is no uh, logical inference, or logical representation in the uh, human mind, at least when, uh, when these uh, uh, scenes are presented. Uh, well, the, the betting story says, okay, in this moment, uh, 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 you only need to bet what, uh, uh, what there is in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this cup. Therefore, for half of the time, the bet will be right, and for half of the time, it will be wrong. So uh, uh, when the bet is right, they should not be surprised. That's what participants expect, that uh, uh, the tulipan was in this, uh, in this cup. And in the other half of the time, there should, there should be a, um, a bet which is wrong. Therefore, participants should make the effort to reconstruct the scene in some other way. Um, what we try to do is we try different techniques to estimate whether really the, uh, the moment in which participants see uh, an inference splits in two in some way, as the hypothesis seems to suggest. Uh, uh, we tried a, a model-based approach in which we used the uh, um, latent class membership estimation to see whether each of the trials would look like the no inference or the inference trials. And we found that this, uh, this uh, class is not uh, giving results split in two. Or we tried to, do, to use a, a data-driven way in which we, we took inference trials and we looked at uh, uh, whether they look more like the no inference trials or they look different. And it turns out that the, the large majority of the trials, one by one, subject by subject, both for adults and for infants, uh, uh, seems to suggest that uh, when there is the moment of making an inference, participants do make a real different kind of uh, uh, um, processing with respect to what is suggested by a betting story. That's where I had to, uh, uh, to come to. I wanted to say that, uh, well, maybe uh, there hasn't been much of a progress since uh, then, back then, uh, about the other issues that were uh, crucial to, in my opinion, to Jacques' uh, uh, interest in language as well. But we do have the, uh, some of the tools that uh, uh, can allow us to answer to them. And uh, therefore, uh, our, uh, my desperate looking at my old files and finding that after all, uh, we didn't really move very much in terms of topics. Um, it's uh, a little, uh, uh, as it were, um, uh, mitigated by the fact that I see a way in which these uh, questions can be finally uh, addressed. And I want to think that Jacques would be happy to see this kind of work and uh, uh, would uh, uh, challenge uh, me with other completely uh, different explanations of what uh, uh, we think we are finding. Thank you very much and sorry for being a little too late. Thank you very much, Luca. Uh, we have time for a couple of short questions. Uh, you can uh, raise your hand in the raise hand function or you can write in the chat question. Let's see if there are questions. Ah, I, I see the chat, no? Oh, no, no, no problem. You see the, you see a question? No, no, the no, there were no questions in the chat. There were old questions or old, uh, okay. So if anyone has a question or comment to Luca, please raise your hand or write in the chat, uh, just question, and then you can ask your question uh, aloud. Uh, if there are no questions, then we can move to the, to maybe to the next presentation. Yeah, uh, last chance to ask a question to Luca. Of course, you can also ask your questions uh, later on in, uh, uh, at the very end or at any point. But uh, I see no questions at the, oh, someone says that Mohinish has a question, which I can- Sorry, just a question. Thanks, Luca. Um, I was just wondering that, you know, this, uh, all your experiments where you have these multiple objects on screen, have you ever considered that the, the, about the format of these representations in the sense that, um, 
one possibility that uh, I was talking to Nicola a while ago is that it's some kind of a, uh, a visual interpretation where you have, you're building multiple models and you're sort of choosing models in some sense, but those models are sort of, you can think of them as uh, imagery that you can imagine multiple models and then you sort of subtract the model that doesn't uh, go with the data. It of course has some form of logical content in the sense that you're negating the models that are not appropriate, but it doesn't seem to have the same sort of um, structure that for example, language might have, right? Where you might need to say A not B. So I wonder if you can comment on that. Uh, uh, yes, uh, I think that uh, um, there are two issues here. One is, did we find, uh, we are following uh, some sort of uh, uh, essentially uh, um, an heuristic here. I don't think that anybody has an idea of really the mental representations uh, underlying reasoning. There are two main schools which, have, which are connected with mental models and mental logic. I'm really indifferent at the moment about this particular question, but whatever this could be, uh, 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 whether it's mental models or mental logic, the point here is that these are uh, accounts that uh, uh, both require that you make some sort of logical uh, representation of a scene. So for example, suppose that you, uh, you think that what is being computed is just mental models. Well, um, that's actually what Wittgenstein was thinking, you know, that you represent possibilities. And I'm, I'm fine with that for this context. You could imagine that at this moment when you don't know what object is inside the cup, you represent different possibilities and you can even construct models the point is that to construct these two models, you need to have the two models, you need to have possibilities. They could be possible worlds, uh, uh, but they must be completely kept distinct. You have to have a logical structure that allows you to distinguish them. So, uh, so they don't amount with the same kind of uh, story. They say, okay, you only present, represent only and always one single world, and you bet on what world you, you want to represent, but you don't keep in mind two kinds of different uh, uh, mental structures. That's number one uh, answer to you. There is still something to be said, although we cannot pinpoint at uh, one piece of evidence that seems to suggest that uh, the mental logic story is better than the mental model story for these results. However, uh, when we look at the uh, neuroimaging of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, both infants and adults, for what we know about imaging, imagery, um, it looks like the kind of uh, resources that the brain puts to contribution to understand these things is quite different from simple images. And, uh, and so I guess that uh, there is an indirect response. Uh, it's a sort of argument to the uh, simplest explanation or to the most coherent explanation with the data. It's not, uh, uh, as it were, a knockdown argument. But I don't think that the kind of results we are finding suggests that uh, uh, participants are actually uh, uh, having in their mind only images. There is a, there is a, this is also true for infants. We do find differences with infants, between infants and adults, but you know, we present only visual scenes and infants have, or adults have no, have no uh, task. So they could just do without doing anything. And yet you find a very considerable involvement of, uh, uh, um, of frontal areas that overlap, at least with the adults, with the exact circuitry that has been described in logical reasoning when logical reasoning is presented verbally. So, you know, I would say there is some evidence that tends to suggest that uh, uh, there might be much more than simple, as it were, mental imagery, which is involved in this task, even if there, is all, there are all the reasons to do mental imagery. These are image, images, these are scenes. And the point here is the, some sort of the Wittgenstein point, right? Scenes are good for you only so far the, uh, as you understand their logic. Otherwise, what do you keep in mind, in memory, when you are seeing these things? You keep in memory some sort of structured reconstruction of the scenes of which images are, don't, uh, are not sufficiently um, uh, articulated to, for which images are not sufficiently articulated to maintain the, what is going on. Thank you very much. Uh, now it's time to move uh, for the next presentation by Marcela Peña. Marcela, can you share your screen? Yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you for inviting. I'm gonna... Can you see my screen? Okay, the screen is okay now. So 
Thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, opportunity to honor Jack and his legacy. Uh, particularly, I want to remark the, the role of Agnes and, and Erno as organizer for this uh, event. So my talk, I, will, uh, I just wanted to tell you something about uh, whether uh, Jacques uh, inspired our study involving uh, brain data uh, and whether the question that he uh, teach me and uh, share with me we, would, uh, we were able to evaluate it with the, from the point of view of the neuroscience, the developmental neuroscience. So the first thing I'm going to tell you that when in 1999, 1999, I was uh, preparing my PhD with uh, Jacques Meller. I arrived to Paris, and I say I told them that uh, I wanted to study uh, because I coming from uh, neonatology, so I wanted to understand exactly what what was the uh, how the brain of a preterm baby works if they were able to to learn if they were able to to do something uh, some linguistic processes to think and also uh, one of the question was uh, very interesting for me was what broca area was doing in in a, in a very preterm baby and how they developed so they gave me he told me that okay you know uh, uh, this is very interesting for us, and here we do language, and give me this book, read this book. Fortunately, the book books uh, in different languages, so I could read it in Spanish. I didn't speak really, uh, I speak a very bad French, and my English is always like a very late uh, language that I can talk. So with this uh, book, I could, uh, uh, I understood that the main question for Jack so he has, the book was a series, presented a series of data that a very strong series of data showing the amazing ability of the, new, of the newborn and also the, the young infant. But uh, he not only showed the data, he always put it a very interesting uh, question, Some, like uh, he presented in this, um, in this conference, the birth of the mind. He was interested in to explore the origin of the human mind and whether the uh, biological and experience uh, uh, interact to produce these uh, humans. And the humans that were very so similar as a species, as a member of a species, but they were so different and uh, unique at the individual level. So uh, interested with, with this uh, goal, because I come from biology, if you want, uh, we wanted to explore how do biology and experience interact to generate this, uh, this constraint. And moreover, he had in the book, he proposed that the, for this moment for me was a very revolutionary idea that the infant were born with a core of knowledge and a, a primitive of some type of knowledge that were there, they were in place at birth. And then, um, allow the infant not only be a passive receiver of the stimulation, but also uh, people, uh, uh, human beings looking for, uh, if you want, looking for, actively looking for selective stimulation in the, in the environment from where they have to learn to be human. So this view that the infant has uh, this capacity not only to receive, but also look directly uh, explicitly, if you look for some type of information in the, in the environment, contrasts to me with uh, this sentence that was done for Albert Einstein. that say the only source of knowledge is experience. So this is what I was thinking in the previous, uh, before to arrive with Jack. And he said, well, if, if this guy, if Jack is a, a clever guy, is trying to test and uh, prove the, the contrary, is saying, uh, I want to be here in this laboratory. So. The first thing that we uh, wanted to do from the biology point, and uh, Jack told me clearly that it was a challenge, uh, it was to measure if with the uh, biological method what, where, what and where the brain is doing when processes languages. So he was very skeptic about the electrophysiology with the EG, and he said, well, uh, I don't uh, know, and I don't believe to this specifically this method, but uh, he put all his effort into study and develop the technique itself to, 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 to define the setup for the study 
of uh, the brain, uh, the infant brain function with this machine, with this technique of optical topography. And the technique was very safe, very non-invasive, and was the possibility to evaluate the activity of the more uh, superficial uh, part of the cortical, the cortex, uh, from a, a non-invasive capture that that is in the scalp. So we used this uh, um, this technique to evaluate uh, the, whether the the infant brain just uh, distinguished forward versus backward. This was the the main, the first main question that we we explored. Uh, this study came from uh, a lot of other uh, previous uh, behavioral studies that uh, were uh, he developed in France with the contribution of Jean Ramus, uh, also Anne Christophe, and, uh, uh, Emmanuel Dupou, and other people, Gisela Deal for sure, and they, they showed that they just, the infant, the neonate, the very the two days old infant, they can could distinguish the languages from different Rhythm, for instance, English versus Japanese, but they couldn't uh, at birth. They couldn't distinguish English from uh, another uh, similar another language that had the similar rhythm. For instance, English and Dutch. Uh, and this, uh, the infant can do this only when the languages were played forward. If you do, if you play backward, this uh, the capacity to distinguish uh, disappears. So we do exactly the same study, and I think uh, Luca has already told you, you know, with the machine of optical topography. And we were very happy because we found that the, uh, in an area that was uh, similar, if you want to, the, if we have this, uh, uh, the left and the right part of the, the brain, and uh, we can see that in this area that correspond to the, uh, we can project the capture to the uh, temporal cortex in the left hemisphere. We found that the response to the, the forward that here is the red line was larger or was uh, significantly different to the blue one that it was backward and also the green one that was the uh, recording during silence. And we were very happy because all the people in the, few, in the, next, in the next year, they also found some similar with the different techniques and different protocols. However, the other study, also with other uh, technique, techniques like functional MRI or other protocols, they show another study also showed that you can find that at birth, the uh, uh, brain is also uh, some uh, advantage in the right hemisphere, and also in some cases it was bilateral. So when we discuss that, uh, when we discuss several years later, we say, well, we propose something that hopefully it could inspire new research and it will be uh, produce a sort of uh, uh, possibilities. That the possibility that depending on the task, depending on the technique, depending on the state or the maturation of the baby, we can find that one hemisphere is more related with the speech processing than the other. So this study was the, uh, I participated in this study, but the, uh, Jack and the team that you uh, can see that is a, a huge, uh, clever guys that, uh, from the Trieste laboratory, they developed a series of another study that I just resumed here, as, as Luca said. So uh, with this idea, I had to come back to Chile because I did my PhD in uh, France and then, uh, then I work in Italy and I have to come back to a country in the south, in the very south of the world. And in this country, we have only EEG. We didn't have a, a, a we didn't have a, any optical topography. So we come back uh, to the, or I come back to the question that I was really interested, that was with how the preterm, what or the brain of the preterm works, and if this extra uh, amounts of stimulation play some role. So he was very interested in this question because he wanted to prove, uh, to evaluate its biology and experience how they interact, and we used this model. Which is the model of the healthy preterm. Uh, preterm is a, it's a baby that is born three months before that expected, and uh, basically we did the question that if that is language uh, acquisition uh, accelerate because you are born before and you receive stimulation before, so if the ability, the linguistic ability, was uh, depending on the stimulation, we have to find that it is the the baby will learn something before. Uh, and if not, if just uh, their biology is sort of constrained and is, is waiting for the level of maturation that allowing you to learn uh, to uh, 
develop this ability. So we have to find that the infant don't have a, an extra or certain advantage or acceleration of the learning um, when they have born three months before. So, and why was this question? Because uh, the first thing that we wanted to say that this is the brain of a baby that was born at six months. And you can see that the radical changes, uh, anatomical changes uh, uh, take place between the three and the ninth month. So they change the anatomy and we don't know, we didn't know in this moment how functionally they were organized, but we wanted to to look what was the uh, impact of receiving information uh, stimulation with this so immature brain. So we first study uh, making a review. Uh, I think, how can we move this? Well, anyway, with the first review uh, we wanted, to, we, we did, it was just to read uh, if the baby was the uh, minimal structure, the necessary structure to process speech. So if when the a premature baby listened to the mother, if the son arrived to the cochlea and go to the thalamus and then arrive to the cortex. At the least we have to have this, uh, uh, we have to uh, recognize that we need this uh, minimal structure to to be able to re to develop the function. So we found uh, uh, that it's indeed when the baby has the, this uh, sylvian seizure and we have the perisylvian area, though the, this was uh, very involved in the language in adults, and also they have uh, at the cortex, they have the sixth layer that we really need when the, for, for, uh, for the, to do any kind of a function at uh, 25, uh, 26 sorry, uh, weeks of gestational age, about three months uh, before uh, the turn. And also the acoustic radiation that go from the uh, thalamus to the cortex that were in place after this, the, the week 24, and also the fascicular cat, especially the ventral part, the part that goes here, was a little bit mature. So in theory, uh, uh, the baby was anatomically ready to learn. They could learn about the speech. So we did uh, two experiments. Uh, make it in, uh, with a junior infant with EG. In this case, we convinced the Jack that EG was the so good. So we say, okay, maybe I can, um, I can, uh, uh, <coughs> I can believe the data. I think he was very excited just uh, until the end. So, and we, what we did, we explored uh, two abilities that were learned. <clears throat> the first one was the rhythmic class. As I told you before, at birth, the baby dis dis uh, discriminated uh, languages from different linguistic uh, rhythm, uh, for instance, English versus Japanese, but they cannot distinguish English versus Dutch because the rhythm is similar. But this is something that rapidly changed, and about uh, the full term, the baby was born at full term, they can distinguish this at 4.5 months. So we say, okay, we will take this baby that have born three months before, and we will look what happened at, uh, if they learn, if they take advantage of these three months, and they can learn this to distinguish the, the languages between uh, the, the native language from the native language from another language from the same rhythm class at 4.5 months after they were birth, after they, they were born, after the birth. So we evaluated that. I'm not going to explain the detail of this data, but we showed that there was no acceleration, not either for the neural maturation. It's not that they, if they, you receive more stimulation, your brain maturate uh, before. And moreover, the, uh, the infant uh, don't learn uh, to distinguish the two languages from the uh, same rhythm, the native language Spanish versus Italian. The, uh, because they had been exposed three months uh, before. But they wait and they can do this after the months that they have been born, when, when, they, when they reach the, uh, the maturation. So this was uh, something that was interesting for us and it was, uh, Jack was uh, a piece of uh, evidence to uh, evaluate what was the role of biology and language. So in this, uh, this study inspired us to advance in another question, for instance, uh, the same learning uh, for, uh, could be explored for um, uh, another, linguistic another linguistic ability that we have to learn is the, to define what is the repertory of the NAD phoneme. And uh, in this case, we collaborate with Gisela Vian and Janet Verker. Uh, uh, inspired by the previous study with Jacques and Preterm, and we also found that 
the baby. This is something that you can find for the repertory, the native repertory of consonant is in the full term is reached about uh, about the, near the 12 months of age. And we look at if this was three months, uh, can accelerate this learning. And we didn't find this. Uh, uh, again, uh, suggesting that there were biological constraints, that there, you need certain type of maturation to really exploit the experience. So another thing that was inspired also in the Jacques' uh, inspiration was to look for a neural mechanism to recognize speech. And this is because usually we say, we have the image, and this is very important, the most infant learn speech in a context like that, you know, where the mother speak with the mother uh, interact or, or any adults or any other human being interact with babies and produce a sort of phenomena like that, that this is very beautiful uh, in, information. But in the real world, they, there are many situations like that. So the infant are exposed to a multiple and complex stimulus, but they, they have to recognize that this is a speech and this is not a speech. It's very nice. Maybe it's very, it's music or it's a bird song or, or it's very, there are stimulus that are so interesting, but I don't have to learn from this, I have to learn from that. So we are exploring now and inspired by this, what uh, trying to find a neural mechanism. In this moment, we are studying uh, whether, for instance, a neural entraining, we can call it neural entraining because it's a possibility to explore whether the oscillatory signal has the human brain as the brain activity, the electrical activity in the brain is oscillatory and whether this can have a, um, a counterpart, if you want, in the, uh, how similar is to the oscillatory activity of the speech. So basically the question is, the, is the brain sampling for speech signal? Because we can think that the infant uh, birth, uh, after birth, they are looking for uh, someone. They are looking for some uh, stimulus that are uh, specific for the uh, for the species. And one could be the faces, of, of course, but also when they are just uh, very young, they can also be looking for some type of speech signal in the middle of any other signal. And maybe the brain has it's implemented with optimal frequency for speech. This is something that was inspired in all the work from uh, David Purple, Nina Kraus, and, uh, and other people that have looked at exploring uh, very seriously this, uh, this, uh, this, ish, this subject. So what we did, we did, uh, sorry, this is bad, but we explored it uh, inspired by the, the study from Luca and Marina in collaboration with Jacques, Luca and Marina, we developed it for, to explore what happened when you have this type of stimulation, when we have to discover word from influence the speech. I'm just gonna tell you, I don't know if you can listen to this. Uh, oh, do you hear? Okay, well, this is, your, this is only to tell you that this is so monotonous, but isochronous. So it's, it's in some ways easy to study whether the, uh, uh, the, the precise frequency we have a, a, an equivalent in the brain. So we use this stimulation to explore whether the adults uh, present the, the uh, entrainment, if you want, to the syllable, because this is the learning uh, task. You don't know what are the words. You have, you have to be, uh, you don't have to know the words, but finally, after some exposition, you discover the word. It's a, it's a, it's a learning, it's a 100% learning task. So at the beginning, your brain in adult uh, is uh, have a very uh, uh, increase in the power at the rate of the syllabic syllabic rate, and then when you discover the word, the power is, is more bigger for the uh, frequency of the um, at the rate of the word. So you initially you just perceive the syllable, but when you discover the word, you perceive the three syllabic word. Okay, and this is reflected in your brain. And we found that in eight months old, a healthy one, and also in preterm, this was very similar. The syllable rate uh, predominant, the power was bigger in the, but at syllable rate, and also at three syllable rate, but not at two syllable rate. So this can tell us that the infant uh, was entrained to syllables and words. And moreover, the, the, we also found that this, uh, the strength or the, the, the intensity of the power of this synchrony, this synchrony that the brain take a, a arrive to to develop with the stimulus at the syllable label at the syllable label can predict how good will you be in the performance recognizing the word after when I show you the word when I uh, let you hear the word uh, isolated. 
So this was this could be a mechanism. I think it's not the mechanism, it's not the one for, for sure, but maybe the brain is, is an, uh, an solitary system that is looking for some um, stimulus in the mid, in the environment that is also oscillatory, which is uh, could be speech, and the ability to uh, and train with this, to synchronize with this, can tell you about how good could you uh, advance in your language acquisition. And finally, I'm going to show, I'm going to tell you uh, just one. Uh, uh, example of collaboration. Jack was something that gave it to me that they can, in this moment I am, I think, several some, some kilometers far from you, uh, and it's what that they allow me to collaborate with big and uh, amazing people like uh, Gisland Dan, Janet Verke, and other people. And Cherry in this moment, Cherry was uh, a student of uh, Janet that came to Chile. And he invited me to participate in this so interesting sensory motor uh, language. They, they have evaluated before. They demonstrated that behaviorally, when the baby have to distinguish it, two phonemes um, that uh, need the, the tongue to, to be pronounced, for instance, the and te, this distinction is interfering when you put a device that uh, uh, in, impair, if you want, or reduce the possibility to move the tongue. And they invited me to participate to their uh, um, research. And uh, in a recent uh, study, we have demonstrated that indeed, when you don't have the teaching toys, the baby can recognize with no problem the difference between da and da. There are two uh, phonemes that need the distinction, the, the, the need to use the tongue to, to make the distinction when we pronounce. However, when you put the teaching toy, the distinction disappears. So it's possible that the, uh, the motor system is, is a part, it's really it's, it's, it's very integrated to the sensory system to uh, advance the language acquisition. So this is, a, I wanted to finish with this, that Jacques Miller uh, promoted collaboration. I think I've, uh, not only with me, I think with a, a lot of Latin American people, uh, he has been their reference to, to do something uh, out of Latin America. So I want to say thank you to also Marina, Gislaine, and Janet, and also more recently, Judith and John Remy, with whom we are more probably a starting a project, and hopefully in the next uh, future, uh, in the near future, with Nuria Sebastian. I think all of you are in the audience today. So I want to say a summary. Uh, uh, what the infant know, I think, uh, Jack, uh, with the inspiration of Jack uh, and with the collaboration of Jack, we have been able to say to say that baby are, are indeed are born with some specific brain structure and network that is specifically sensitive to process language. The neural maturation can pace and shape the language acquisition. Of course, experience too. And maybe neural entrainment could be one of the mechanisms of the, the allow the infant to detect and selectively uh, process some type of stimulus from the complex environment. That language acquisition probably involves other systems. This is a multimodal process. And uh, I think uh, what the, the question of Jack Miller, that what do the infant know uh, with respect uh, that have uh, 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 that our brain study can uh, may serve to fit uh, the current model of language acquisition and also in clinical, because I come from clinical, I think it could be very useful as helpful to identify predictors and design a good intervention. So thank you, Jack Miller, for all your inspiration. And I want to finish with this sentence that is from Isaac Newton. And he say, if I have seen further, it's worth, uh, because I'm by standing in the shoulder of giant. Of course, I'm not. I said you too, but certainly Jack is I was a giant. So thank you. Thank you very much, Marcela, for the very interesting talk. Uh, we have some time for a couple of um, short questions or comments. Uh, please uh, use the raise hand function or write in the chat question. question and you will be unmuted and you can ask your question. Uh, always. I'm trying to, to check the, whether there are raised hands. I don't see any. I will check now the chat. I, yes, I see a question by Judith Gerwin. Yes, so um, 
Thank you very much, Rosella. This was both really beautiful scientifically and personally. Uh, so it's actually quite hard to ask a question, uh, really just scientifically, but let me, uh, let me give it a try. So when you're talking about preterm infants, and so you, you will know that this relates very closely to the work I do, uh, you raise two options. One is that um, postnatal experience might accelerate learning, and this is not what you find in your work. Uh, but if it was the case, then we would see that pre premature infants are faster um, or they need biological maturation. So the brain needs to be given its time to mature. Uh, and so this early experience is not uh, helping them. And so I think there's a third possibility, not um, e exclusive with, uh, with the maturational account, namely that um, preemies also miss up out on prenatal experience. And so we know that speech prenatally is very different than speech postnatally because it's uh, low pass filtered and it's mostly prosodic. And I'm wondering what you think about that. So um, in addition to um, needing maturation, maybe one, uh, one other factor is that uh, preemies miss something that of course is by no means deterministic. You can learn language without this prenatal experience, but maybe under nor normal circumstances, it's some sort of a bootstrap or some sort of simpler signal, which by being simpler actually helps learning precisely by providing prosodic information or prosodic structure, which we know is so crucial for learning about language at any level. So lots of the people who are here today have worked on how prosody bootstraps different aspects of language from word learning to grammar and all of that. So I wonder, I'm wondering what you think. So thank you for the question, Judy. I think you are totally right. I mean, uh, when you are born in preterm, you lose not only uh, the experience, the, the, the experience, the sensorial experience that you can receive in the last months of the, but also the, you have a lot of uh, biochemical information, a sort of a lot of hormone that produce the placenta at the end, etc. So there are many factors that can involve, and I'm pretty sure that uh, this uh, could be something that we can explore. And one something that you say that this thing is very important, and we we have not uh, developed it, that maybe when when the baby when the preterm baby is born, we don't have to talk to them because usually in clinical you say put the baby here and speak. So you speak here, just it's so it's very strong. Even if you speak like that. Uh, it's very strong the stimulation. Maybe you just have to uh, stimulate with the filter of the speech or something that is more uh, recreating the situation that how maybe the, the, the mother voice, but in a way that they could listen as it was in the inside of the uterus. So it's very it's a very good proposal and innovative that uh, I expect that uh, we can uh, you can uh, develop in the future. Thank you. Further questions or comments? We have time for one more, maybe. But in case, yes, there was Luca, you raise your hand or no? Yeah, yes. Uh, can I speak? Am I? Am I... Yeah, yeah, we hear you. Okay, thank yes. you very much, Marcella. Um, I, I have a question. Um, uh, you know, you can, it's difficult not to see history of this discipline in waves, but probably because there is no stabilization yet, although there is progress. And so, you know, Jacques started out as one of the essentially the killers of uh, the Piagetian story. And now Piaget is coming back with a vengeance, in, certainly in, uh, in, uh, in uh, higher level cognition, uh, quote unquote. Um, I'm always puzzled about understanding exactly what is going on with the, uh, uh, with the results that uh, um, uh, Janet Berker and you have uh, with respect to the role of sensory motor experience in, uh, in the language um, perception in this case. So I wonder if you have some idea. I mean, I don't think this is a result that Jacques would have particularly liked. That's my feeling. So, uh, and I don't know really how to explain it. And I wonder whether you have any, um, what does it mean to say that there is some sensory motor component in language, uh, hmm. in language processing? Because, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, how about uh, the traditional kind of uh, issues about, uh, well, you know, there, are, there is an incredible variability in uh, the sensory motor makeup of uh, 
uh, infants and yet there is a convergence which is pretty strong. Do you challenge that or I wonder if you have some clue no. about what to think about these results? Yeah, I think the, well, this is a, a study I told you that was a, 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 is the property, if you want. The idea come from Janet Berke and the Cherry Choi and this, Gisela and these people. So, but I think we agree that it's not, we are not establishing a, a, not either a, a causal relationship. It's not that the, the motor and sensor and perception are causally one of the, one is of the other. But maybe what we believe, I think I believe, that uh, it, the infant has at the beginning when they, a part of the core knowledge, they already know how the movement of the articul articulatory system are. And the phonoarticulatory system are, is important because it's important because language is important for human. And if you want, is a, this is maybe a cartoon, but when, when the baby is born, the baby can walk. You put the baby here and they have the walk reflex, you know? And then because, but they will not use it. It's something that belongs to the species. The species will work when you are ready, when you are maturationally ready. So maybe uh, we can uh, uh, interpret that the role of the, of the motor activity in this moment is just a sort of a knowledge about what is the possibility of the motor plan that you will use when you, in the moment that you have to talk. But it's not a causal. I mean, it's not the, the motor, motor theory of language that in this case, you, the language is, is completely dependent on the capacity or the development of the motor. I think it's just a, something that exists because you are human. You will, work, you will speak, so you have a primitive of the, the, the planning of how I have to, I have to move my phone articulatory system to, walk, to talk when I have to talk, in, when I'm ready to talk. I don't know if I answered your question, but it's a... Uh... Yeah, I guess, I guess what you are suggesting is that there is no, as it were, ground or foundational part of these results. That does, they don't say much about, uh, for example, language acquisition or language proficiency in terms of speech, but they say something about some sort of online uh, sort of automatic reflex of rehearsing some kind of uh, articulatory gesture. Is that the way you interpret it? Namely, that this may be... Yeah. That, uh, Somewhat I don't like like reflex. I don't like that it's, it's a reflex. It's just a, a multi a multimodal representation that is not necessarily a reflex like walk. I think it's but it, it just to uh, just to explain that uh, it's something that you already know because you are human. It's, it's a part I think of the core knowledge. I have seen Janet shaking her head. Would you like to add something, Janet? Oh, Janet. Can we unmute you? Where is Janet? Uh, can someone unmute Janet? There, I'm unmuted. Um, Hi. Hi, it's so nice to see all of you. And I'm so flattered that Marcella um, included um, some of our joint work because I love Jock. So this is my comment to say how happy I am to have had my work a little bit part of this symposium. Um, so um, yeah, there we're trying to develop some, I mean, we've been thinking for a long time about where this might come from. And I probably have a different point of view than Marcella and a slightly different point of view than Sherry. Um, but um, the notion it's not, it's not a Liberman motor theory of speech perception. It's basically one in which the initial representation that babies have by birth is already multi-sensory. Um, and it's based in part on the, the, some of the findings that Marcella shared and that you shared, Luca, in your talks on the structural and functional connectivity being there prior to birth to support auditory and motor integration in the language systems. Um, so neuroanatomically and neurofunctionally, as well as um, um, the kind of uh, spontaneous um, activity that one sees 
in setting across the mammalian system and perhaps beyond in setting up uh, sensory motor systems. So just, you know, spontaneous activity dependent um, neurogenesis establishing circuits that allow motor systems and sensory systems to be sensory motor systems. And we don't see why each should be any different than that. And so in this case, some of the work on um, uh, the tongue protrusions and things that babies fetuses are doing even prenatally that may, um, that, are, that are necessary for aerodigestion to work at birth. Otherwise they die with the first suckling, so they suffocate if they hadn't established a lot of mechanical sort of control over that. And that perhaps that gives them the opportunity to map out the oral motor space that then um, uh, uh, speech can map onto. And then also just, um, um, it's not unique to humans. Lots of animals, and particularly the work with bird song, Dick has just chatted with me during this talk, um, is, is, you know, their, their sensory motor and, and lots of other species. So that's just a little bit of, I wasn't expecting to say anything. And I just have my sweater on over my nighty. So here we go. <laughs> but thank you, Martha. Thank you. Um, I see no more questions and we will, we should move on. Amanda, can you, we now move to the short section, short talk section. Can you put Amanda your slides on? Can you share your screen? Okay, can you hear me? Yes. So, um, hello everybody. I'm, I'm really happy to see you all. And, um, and I'm honored to be able to open up the short session. I will try to, to, to present uh, as shortly as possible this study that I uh, decided to, to share with you today. Um, it's uh, actually one of the studies that I've done in collaboration with Irs uh, Bulagarofora, where I collaborated in the last uh, two years and a half. And um, um, it's not done in collaboration with any of the previous, my previous collaborators, so it's just a completely separate thing. But in the course, I've actually um, realized that I'm kind of doing things that were interesting for this group too, somehow. Um, I hope you will find it uh, interesting as well. So uh, the idea of the study was to um, explore auditory attention uh, in young children with cochlear implants. Why? Well, one obvious, wait, doesn't go. Okay. Um, so one obvious, obvious reason is that uh, specifically attention to speech is some sort of a general prerequisite for language acquisition. Um, we know from many different studies where many of you collaborated uh, that normally hearing infants from birth on are specifically attuned to sounds that are speech-like and they prefer sounds that are speech-like over other sounds. But uh, the story is a little bit different with deaf children because they don't have access to any sounds. So we know, at least from this line of research that was led by Houston and his lab in the last two decades, that the attention to speech is reduced in children, in deaf children, even after they receive cochlear implants, at least compared to uh, hearing age matched children. So the children that were exposed to the same, same amount of, of auditory input till then. So the reasons why can be various. Uh, in this particular study, we wanted to, um, to pay attention to this technical kind of possible reason. We know that the, the electrical signal that is transmitted to the auditory nerve by a cochlear implant uh, is different from unprocessed signal that, um, that we receive as normally hearing listeners. We know that it's degraded. We know that the, um, that at least uh, so we know that the the um, extraction of signal amongst the background noise is worse compared to normal uh, hearing system. 
So we thought maybe this is actually influencing the, the attention to speech and we can measure this online. Uh, we also saw that an online measure of, um, of attention to speech, like online um, um, objective measure on, of attention to speech in these children could have clinical applications later on. So if you ask me what would Jacques say about this study, because this is sort of a, a, a red line of, of these talks, I am not sure. I, I was never sure when I talked to him and I wouldn't be sure now. Um, I think he would appreciate um, the exploration of auditory properties, uh, of the properties of auditory signal that could influence the, the attention to speech, because this sounds like a, an interesting sort of um, uh, part of the puzzle. But I don't think he was never really um, uh, interested in clinical applications of, of any of his work. I don't know. I, I know, I'm, I'm almost sure that he would hate some of the aspects of um, the design of this experiment though, because I'm not happy with it entirely either. Um, we didn't have the opportunity to test as many children as it would be nice to have a, um, um, a full set of data. Um, because uh, our, our center is small and we could only get 14 children that matched our criteria because we wanted to test young children that had uh, congenital hearing loss and were implanted early on before 24 months of age and that had cognitive abilities normally developing and no visual deficits. So we were actually constrained very much. Um, so yeah, we tested these 14 children and we tested 13 chronologically age-matched uh, normally hearing children. The idea was to test 14, but we never reached the 14 because of the last horrible year. Um, anyway, uh, uh, due to different uh, interests of the members of the, 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 the research group that, uh, that collaborated in this uh, study, um, we were sort of bound to include too many conditions. So in the end, we wanted to test, uh, to test different signals, different background noise levels, and, uh, and children with cognitive co uh, cochlear implants, both with both cochlear implants on or with just one, left or right. So it's sort of a complicated design, but this is what we got. Um, e so what I was happy about, and I think Jacques would be happy about too, is to, that we, we, we um, we used uh, pupillometry as an index of auditory attention. And it's nice because it's um, um, a relatively easily administered and, um, and it seems a, a, like a, a good method to, to, to study an online attention in, in young children. Uh, and also because, uh, because speech and spe the pupil diameter seems to be a, um, a function of speech intelligibility. It goes up until a medium, uh, medium a level of intelligibility and then goes down when, the, when intelligibility decreases again. But this has only been studied in adults and children at school, school age, more or less. Uh, so we don't really, we didn't really know at the beginning if this is the case also in, in young children and how do they react at different, at the different intelligibility levels anyway. So anyway, our study looked like this, uh, we, we had the trial structure looked like this. Uh, we uh, gaze contingent attractor was followed by a uh, five second anima animated clip and followed by four to nine seconds pause. Uh, we have followed initial, initial pre-processing. We have actually just um, averaged the whole uh, five second uh, period of, of, of time, except for the 200 milliseconds of um, of a baseline period at the beginning. Uh, and uh, the average values of pupil diameter were then entered into the, into the mixed models. We, I will now present just uh, like preliminary results uh, and part of them because yeah, uh, we are still sort of finalizing it. But um, we have divided the, um, the, the the whole data set into two groups because primarily we were interested in how do how what is the the difference between the control group and children with cochlear implants when both implants are on how what's the difference in their listening and uh, we mm, 
So we were interested in the three-way interactions so between the noise and the signal and, and the two groups. And it turned out that there is a weak interaction between these three factors, but there is an overall difference between controls and bilateral uh, bilet when, um, children when they have uh, both implants on. Uh, because presumably because there is an overall difference, presumably because they have the, the controls came there to, to the center for the first time and they were sort of, they were more excited. Whereas pilot, the children with cochlear implants were there for many times and they had their rehabilitation process there. So that's maybe one of the reasons. However, there are also uh, there are also differences that are related to the to the to the stimuli themselves. So there seems to be an overall difference, uh, an overall interaction between noise and session, such that uh, bilateral uh, so children with cochlear implants react more to, to different noise levels. And we see that there is this sort of um, um, reverse pattern for, for speech and, um, and music in both groups. Uh, due to the sample size, it's not, it's close to significant, but not significant, this interaction. However, it's, it's interesting that both groups exhibit more um, a higher pupil dilation, so maybe more attention to speech when there is no background sound, uh, background noise compared to background background noise to, to, to the to the noise environment. Another thing that came up uh, as as a consequence of, of uh, analysis of uh, the sessions when children had only left and the right implant on, and that is actually quite interesting and was not expected at all, is that children, when they have only left implant on, um, have the, when they have only left implant on, the, the pupil dilation is higher for, uh, for speech and lower for music and vice versa when they have only right implant on. And that is actually sort of resembling the right ear preference for speech and left ear preference for music that are um, indices of um, uh, auditory cortex letterization and have been attested in normal, normally hearing adults and children many, many times. And if that is the case also in children with cochlear implants, it's, um, it's sort of an interesting piece of information that I haven't um, seen anywhere else in the literature before. Um, but the main, the main result that we sort of were looking at after is that we saw that there are categorical differences between attention to speech and attention to music, that they react differently. And that is the case both in children with cochlear implants and controls. And if, if really the absence of background noise will elicit more attention to speech, that could actually have um, an, a, a consequence also for, for um, like clinical applications because uh, the good signal to noise ratio may be important uh, aspect of, of, uh, of language acquisition. But also we have noticed that uh, children with um, uh, uh, both controls and, and children with cochlear implants um, have overall higher, uh, higher, higher pupil dilation when um, when any signal is present compared to silence. And that led us to think of the possibility to use the populometry as an auditory signal detection measure for um, measuring um, um, uh, audibility thresholds. And that's something that we are now about to start. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Amanda. As uh... Unfortunately, we are behind schedule, so we will continue with the short talks and uh, you can, there will be, uh, you can ask the questions, uh, please keep your questions in mind and um, uh, the questions can be asked at the very end. So can you, Alan, can you share your screen? Yes. What I forgot to mention that in the short talks, um, we, uh, we thought that it would be nice to highlight at least one study, which uh, Jacques would strongly agree or disagree, and just to mention why. Yes, yes. please, Alan. Thank you for inviting me, and it's extremely nice to um, see you all after all this time. And um, 
I, I wanted to present uh, a study that we've been working on in Potsdam with, um, in collaboration with Mireya Marimon and Barbara Höhle, which in fact touches on many of the kind of discussions about um, um, speech segmentation in infancy that we used to discuss in the lab in Trieste. And uh, um, it's kind of sad that uh, now there's no, no longer a possibility to actually go, um, go to Jacques and ask about these old kind of um, topics that we used to, um, used to work on. But um, let me start. And um, my talk will be about speech segmentation and pupillary entrainment. Um, the study is, um, got started because, um, so we know that infants can, during the first year of life, infants can segment speech with prosodic cues as well as statistical regularities. And uh, understanding how these cues interact uh, in infant speech segmentation experiments might be informative in um, how infants actually uh, segment continuous speech during the first year of life. So one way of um, investigating how these cues interact has been proposed by Tiesler and Safran in 2003, where they familiarized infants with uh, continuous speech streams where prosodic cues were in conflict with statistical ones. And what they observed is that um, younger English learning in infants um, segmented the streams predominantly with statistical cues, whereas older infants started to use the prosodic cues instead, suggesting that there's a kind of developmental shift in um, cue weighting in infancy, where infants start with statistical regularities that are thought to be um, domain general and independent of the um, let's say, um, the uh, lang uh, lang independent of language, and then acquire the, let's say, native language prosodic structures um, through um, statistical cues. Now, um, the experiments that um, have been done and we are doing now in, uh, at Potsdam uh, with German learning infants suggest that uh, we are not necessarily replicating this kind of developmental change. So um, when we test the same experiment with six months old German learning infants, we don't find this deep uh, initial reliance of uh, statistical regularities, which may be caused by the fact that German, uh, the prosodic structure of German is considerably more regular than English um, prosodic structure, especially when we are looking at lexical prosody. So um, this left, leads open to alternatives, namely maybe German learning infants are starting with TPs, but they converge on the native language prosody way before English infants do. Or as uh, our um, uh, pilot studies with um, older German uh, learning infants suggest is that maybe they are actually um, becoming sensitive or they start weighing statistical cues more than prosody later uh, than English ones. And this is supported by the fact that when um, we did this experiment with nine month old German learning infants, they showed no preference. So this of course may be the caused by the fact that we are observing a, um, experimental failure. So um, because of the consistency of the group or something. Alternatively, however, if you're um, looking at the lo uh, looking times, there seem to be patterns that suggest that maybe some of the infants are segmenting these streams with prosodic cues and others are doing with um, statistical ones. So the study I present today is trying to um, investigate this nine month old German learning um, segmentation abilities in this uh, experiment by using pupillometry. And um, pupils are interesting because um, recent studies with um, non-human primates suggest that uh, pupillary changes, so pupil dilations and uh, constrictions at stimulus frequency can become um, temporarily aligned with segmented sequences of tones, meaning that the, the pupils are precisely temporarily aligned with the occurrence of tone sequences, like recurring tone sequences in auditory stimuli. Now we have um, now um, uh, some evidence from uh, adult humans that this is also the case um, for um, sequences, for example, where we have alternation of prominence. So when um, auditory sequences where you would parse syllable streams into bisyllables according to prosodic cues. And what happens is that the pupillary changes that the stimulus frequency become precisely aligned with the, with the kind of perceived um, syllable groups, suggesting that um, the 
temporal alignment of the pupils as the speech signal unfolds may be informative about um, how infants uh, or, or listeners in general are actually um, segmenting the familiarization streams while they unfold, right? And um, alternative, of course, it's also interesting because now if you're considering all these theories of, of um, neural entrainment and in this case, pupillary entrainment, um, what seems to be happening is that um, the kind of experiments that we used to do about speech segmentation using statistical regularities, for example, TPs or prosodic cues, are actually also the key kind of experiments that can tell us what entrainment really um, entails, right? So um, to give, give you an uh, idea how these experiments look like, is that participants were familiar with the sequence of syllables where every second syllable carried German lexical stress. So um, according to German lexical stress rules, these would be um, segmented into words like puta, debi, and tota. Uh, however, if participants were paying attention to um, statistics, namely transition probabilities, they could um, also segment the stream into words like go, puta, debi, to, where the transition probabilities between syllables within words were always one, and the transition probabilities between um, uh, words were 0.33. And um, so the um, main point being that the prosodic word boundaries always straddled the statistical word boundaries. So, and what we expected is that um, we measured particip uh, nine month old German learning infants and uh, German speaking adults uh, pupil size throughout the experiment. And we expected that if listeners are segmenting the family adjacent stream into prosodic words, um, the pupillary response, we should observe dilations and constrictions in the pupillary response that are temporarily aligned with the onset of prosodic words. And if they are segmenting the familiarization stream predominantly with statistical cues, the pupillary response should be uh, temporarily aligned with statistical cues, meaning that um, uh, with respect to the familiarization stream onset, there should be a shift depending on which way participants are segmenting the familiarization stream. So um, essentially what we, uh, what we did, we took the pupil response throughout the familiarization phase and um, transformed it from the time domain to the frequency domain and looked at the temporal alignment of the component of the pupil response at stimulus frequency. So how, uh, at the frequency at which the words occurred during the familiarization stream. And um, what we find, so on the left, um, you see um, the, uh, um, adult participants' responses, and on the right, the nine-month-olds. As you can see on uh, the upper panel, um, panel A, shows the temporal alignment of the pupil response at word frequency during the familiarization phase in adult participants, where zero corresponds to the beginning of all the statistical words, and three to the onset of all the prosodic words. And what you can see is that as a group, participants' pupillary responses are clustering around prosodic word onsets, right? So now when we compare this uh, pupillary response during the familiarization stream to their um, pupillary response to test words, which were either prosodic words or statistical words, we see that those participants whose pupils were more aligned with the prosodic word onsets showed larger pupil dilation to statistical words than to prosodic ones, suggesting that they were, suggesti uh, they were um, segmenting prosodic words. Now, um, in nine month olds, and in accordance with the uh, behavioral data from um, previous studies with nine month old German learning infants, you can see that the pupil response during the familiarization stream was actually not at, on a group level clustering either with statistical words or prosodic words. However, if you are now looking at the relationship between the pupil responses during the uh, familiarization and infants pupil size change, uh, pupil response at test, we see that those infants whose pupils were more aligned with statistical word onsets here at zero, showed larger pupil dilations to prosodic words to, than to statistical ones, meaning that they were segmenting um, statistical words. And those infants whose pupils were more aligned with the prosodic word onsets showed the reverse pattern, uh, meaning that they were segmenting uh, prosodic words, right? So um, as the um, 
um, stimuli of the experiments, of course, were unnatural, meaning that uh, the words were occurring regularly and rhythmically during the familiarization stream. We were also interested in how this kind of entrainment may relate to um, language development in um, later on. And as we cannot, can, as we couldn't ask uh, the, the infants, young infants, um, about their vocabulary development before a certain age. We um, only did a follow-up questionnaire about language development when these uh, infants became 40 months of age. So basically this shows um, um, grammar and vocabulary um, perform uh, production uh, performance indicated by the parents when the infants um, became um, three years old. And here, as you can see, is that those infants who at nine months were uh, more entrained to the statistical words, uh, signaled by zero here, had performed, outperformed on grammar, um, grammar uh, part of the questionnaire on the vocabulary one. And vice versa for those infants who were um, entrained to prosodic words, um, who, had, who were more likely to pronounce the words in the questionnaire than the grammatical constructions. So um, while this is not direct evidence for um, statistical regularities and prosody playing different roles, it sort of does um, point to a um, direction that um, in development, the, the weighing or, or, or the importance of these, um, these cues may be related to different kind of um, processes, right? So to, um, to conclude, um, we um, shown that infants, pupils can and train to um, syllable, um, bisyllabic groups, single based prosodic as well as statistical cues. And that the temporal alignment of the pupillary um, response and trained to the temporal regularities in the familiarization phase is actually informative about infants performance on um, recognizing the words at test. And um, um, it seems that at least with the stimuli that we have and in our experiments, German learning infants may only start weighing statistics more than prosody, at least some of these infants at nine months of age, which is considerably later than uh, is currently um, um, known for English learning infants. Right. And um, sorry, and Exactly, so like um, um, the kind of the role the two cues play, so statistical regulatory or lexical prosody may um, subserve different, different roles, which is not directly uh, evident from uh, experiments that are using um, familiarization streams of um, nonsense words, right? So like you, can, you can segment this continuous speech stream, speech stream either with statistics or with prosody, but actually um, what the infants extract or what this corresponds to um, uh, may uh, differ in natural language stimuli. Okay. And um, to, to have a few, a few minutes. Actually, not really. <laughs> we are 20 minutes behind schedule, but yes, try to. Okay. So um, I, I, um, what I wanted to say is that um, I'm not entirely sure, entirely sure how um, Jacques or, or even, you know, like the lab uh, or the, um, how I'd say, the lab meetings would go presenting this kind of results, but I think they're interesting in a way because um, it, the results suggest that we can, um, extract some sort of temporary regularities related to auditory stimuli and possibly from speech from the pupil response. Now, this is, of course, this highly rhythmic signal. So the fact that the pupil is in training to temporary regularities may not be that surprising. However, um, the kind of um, findings that we have here, we are now extending to more natural stimuli and it actually looks quite uh, surprisingly uh, promising that at least some of, the, uh, even if you're looking, uh, uh, listening to more natural stimuli, like listen, listening to sentences, you can find this kind of temporary regularities in the pupil, right? And um, what I think is that um, Jacques would really hate about these results is that when we are actually looking at these correlations between the um, TPs and prosody and the later language development is that um, 
we seem to find the opposite kind of um, pattern where the statistics seems to be correlated better with grammar than with vocabulary, right? And this is something that we don't only find here, but with German learning infants, also with the six months old who are, who are showing predominance for um, prosodic cues, the same kind of correlations pan out. So um, it's something that we are not entirely sure why this happens, but it's, it, it seems to be replicable um, across, across ages and across infant groups. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will move the questions to the very last, more informal session. Uh, so if someone has to leave, could leave. And we switch now to a presentation of Anna. Can you share your screen, Anna? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you okay. and now we see your screen as well. You see my screen? Okay, perfect. So it's very nice to, to see all of you. I mean, it feels a bit like old times. Uh, and I cannot put it on full screen now. Okay, is it okay? Yes, okay. So, and thanks, Agi, for the opportunity of of presenting. So I want to share with you some experiments on what can neonates learn from distributional cues in speech, which I think like Shaq was always very interested in what neonates could learn. So I think this could be interesting. So it's, uh, I won't be able to go into the details, but uh, because otherwise it would be too dense, but I, I wanted I, to share the directions we are exploring together with uh, Luca Benjamin, Mary Palou and Shislen de Van Lambert. So as you know, since the work of Safran, and Newport and Aslin, uh, we know that eight months olds can segment continuous speech based on distributional cues. And so basically after a few minutes, they are able to distinguish the words from, from the stream from... Uh, sorry, Anna, we see, sorry, Anna, we see your notes as well and your slides. Ah, so okay. it's the presenter so, mode. I can I'm sorry, I cannot see the I will do this. So is it okay? Yes, now we see only the slide. Yeah, okay. So so we know that they can uh, they can extract the words and this has been extended across different domains and all sorts of different species. So statistical learning seems to refer to a very general capacity of extracting, extracting distributional properties from the sensory input. So this leaves actually a lot of questions to answer from like which information is actually computed and when is what is later encoded. Like if there are some like biological biases that were, uh, were affect which statistical properties are extracted or how this could be influenced by previous experience and ultimately how this is implemented in the brain. And we need to understand. And we need to understand this. I mean, to be able to understand the role of statistical learning in different aspects of cognition, we need to understand these questions across domains, across the species, and across development. And so, in particular, here I will focus on speech and on neonates. And I think this is an interesting, an interesting point because neonates have very limited experience, or at least different experience, before being born than when they are born. And moreover, the brain is still immature. So we could wonder how this is implemented in the neonatal brain and whether there are changes uh, across development. And so what we, we know about the statistical learning at birth. So there are different experiments, uh, behavior and, and uh, using EEG showing actually that neonates are sensitive to distributional cues. And these experiments are, show differential responses during the learning period. And then during my PhD, we did a, another experiment using NIRS in which we showed that not only neonates are sensitive to distribution cues, but they can actually extract the words conforming the stream and remember them at least for a few minutes. And actually, Jack was kind of so-so with these results. And I think, but basically it was because he would ask, okay, but what do this tell, what does it tell to us this? And I think the main point was we were not maybe answering too much the previous questions I was referring before. And this is partially what we're trying to, to do now. So I actually we have more questions that answer, but we are trying. 
And so in principle, we have uh, three things. Now we are exploring. We want a, a robust market of, uh, of, of, of learning. We, will we want to try to understand what is computed and later what is encoded. And we want to know if uh, a statistical learning is computed in the same way across different features of a speech. And to do so, we are using EEG because it provides us with a good temporal resolution. Uh, and uh, moreover, it's not invasive, so it's very, very good for, to use with neonates. And so uh, many people have already talked a lot about neural entrainment, but basically we know is that we have a, a stimulation that is periodic and in a certain frequency, then this would cause an evoke response that will be stable. And so the best way to analyze this kind of data would be to look to, to move to the frequency domain and analyze it in the frequency domain. So if we go to our stimulation, if we have some syllables that, for example, are presented at, at four hertz, what we would see is in terms of the power and increased power at four hertz, and also because the activity is phase locked with the with the with the syllables along the familiarization, we would see that the phases are all let's say together. But if, moreover, there is a structure, and this structure it's regular, so it comes with uh, always at, at, at the same uh, with same distance, let's say. So, for example, if there are three syllabic words, and we detect this, and now we detect this, or we start perceiving the stream as of, 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 as conforming by three syllabic words, we will also see a response that is uh, phase locked to the onset of the words, and then we will see an increase in power at the syllabic rate and the same for uh, for the phases so in the first experiment we tried to develop the an, uh, like a, a robust neural markers of learning and to try to understand what neon is compute and encode and so basically the neon is has some periods of resting states some periods of random syllables some periods of a stream that have a structure and here we will look to neural entrainment and moreover in the post learning phase they will hear some test words that could adhere to the distribution of profit of the stream in different ways. And we will look to the ERPs trying to know what they, what, they, what they encoded after learning. And basically, we will take in consideration two points. So one is the coherence of the syllables, so basically BTPs. And the other point is whether they actually chunk the stream and now they form a word representation that includes other information. For example, remember, remembering which is the first syllable of a word, which is the second, which is the third. So some kind of ordinal encoding. So going to the neural entrainment, the results are quite clear. So for resting state, both for power and phase locking value, we don't see any entrainment at any frequency. During the random, we can see entrainment at the syllabic rate. And when there is a structure, we see entrainment also at the word rate on the first harmonic. And moreover, if we now compute this like in time windows of one minute, like if we focus on the orange line here, so here starts the, the structure. And we see at the beginning, we don't have entrainment here. And, and more or less at the second minutes we already have. So it takes like around two minutes. This tells us that it takes around two minutes for to the neonates to chunk the stream. And so, okay, it seems they can chunk, but what do they encode? So we have this kind of test words. I won't go to the detail, but basically we can divide, we can see that there are some sequences in that were never heard. So they strongly violated the, the distribution of properties of the streams and others that were heard. So they don't violate it so strongly. And when we we look to this contrast, we don't see any difference. But when we look to another contrast, that is sequences that respect ordinal precision versus sequences that do not respect. So you can see that sequences that respect starts by a first syllable, where sequences that do not respect ordinal precision start by a second syllable. But there is not any TP violation till the third sequ sequence in both cases. When we look to this contrast that we see, it's an early differential response in frontal areas and in occipital left areas, and a more sustained response afterwards. And this tells us that infants are, are segmenting, are chunking, but moreover are encoding something else at TPs. They are actually forming a, a word representation and maybe encoding some kind of ordinary information, or at least encoding which is the first syllable. And so, but still, we don't know, really know what is encoded. And this is mainly the work of uh, Luca, of his PhD thesis. He has very nice work on infants and adults. But I will just present a very uh, experiment that he did with neonates, because it's very similar to the previous ones, but it's just a bit harder. So basically, it's very similar. But instead of three syllabic words, he has four syllabic words. And um, because we thought, OK, maybe this is too hard, we had two group of babies. One with continuous speech and one with very subtle pauses that were marking the, the words uh, boundaries. 
And, uh, and we will have like test words again, so word, part words, and some sequences that Luca called shuffle words that basically strongly violate the, the statistical structure of the stream. And what you see in neural entrainment with contrast structure versus random at the word rate, he doesn't see any difference, so it seems infants are not succeeding at chunking, but whatever the process they succeed. And results with the, all the ERPs are kind of similar in the sense that when there are when the stream is continuous, infants, there is a difference, but the difference is between sequences that strongly violated the distributional properties versus something that they heard. Where when there are pauses, the words are different. So it really means that you're chunking. So this means that by slightly alterating the stream, so just making the, the words one syllable longer, neonates are not able to chunk anymore. So I this tells us that we need to understand a bit better what is actually what they are computed, and in some circumstances, some extra speech cues are needed. And just to finish, I want to be to go very quickly on this experiment that I think is quite nice, but the results are a bit surprising. So now the question was: Do we comp do we co do neonates compute uh, like uh, distributional properties of on, uh, on any feature of a speech? So we used two orthogonal properties. So one was phonemes of syllables. And the other were voices. We have six different syllables and six different voices. And one group of babies uh, were uh, familiarized with a stream in which the structure was over the syllables, meaning that the TPs were one or 0 0.5 between the, between the syllables, conforming the syllabic words. And the voices were changing randomly all the time. And the other was the, the, the orthogonal situation was the opposite. So there was a structure over the voices, but the TPs were flat and, and random. And, uh, and this, I think, experiment, in, at least in the design chat, will, will have love because it's trying to understand if there is at least some kind of biological bias on computing, uh, of computing the statistics or one or other feature of a speech. And this, the design was pretty similar. And, and we will look for neural entrainment and for uh, about responses for test sequences in the post learning phase. And the results, I think the design was. The results were quite surprising for me, and I think it would have been also maybe for Shaq, because neonates succeed on both. I was expecting them to succeed on the syllables, but probably fail on the voices, which is actually quite hard. I, I cannot do it on the voices, and they succeed. So this actually maybe opens some question. The results of the ERP, it's uh, still preliminary. We, we need to see some stuff, but it seems that there are a difference and the topographies are quite similar. So just to conclude, we I think we have a we managed to have a robust neural marker of uh, of learning, and actually this is interesting. We are starting to test it on uh, on, on on different population, maybe to use it as a, as, as a early detection of some developmental issues. Regarding what is computed and encoded, we still don't know, but uh, um, it seems that we're hypothesis that it's first uh, we we extract distributional properties. And in a second step, we can eventually chunk the we can eventually chunk the stream, and this could happen based only based on distributional cues. And in some circumstances, we may need other cues, so we really need to understand a bit better what is going on. And in terms of the computation of distributional properties over different features of a speech, it's quite surprising that neonates succeed on both. And then the question is: this, Does this property remain, or is it maybe due because neonates have less experience with the phonetic? context of, of a speech. And this is all, and thank you, and thank Shislen, Luca, and Marie. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, we are 20 minutes behind schedule, but uh, I would like to ask you to bear with me. Of course, if someone has to leave, then... Uh, and we have a couple of more short presentations. One is Silvia, can you put on your slides, Silvia? And Silvia and Anna, yeah. sh so stop sharing. And uh, we will have uh, one more short presentation by Sylvia and then a couple of really one slide, very flash, uh, two minute presentation by a couple of people. So, and then at the end, we will have the, the prize uh, announcement. So please bear with us with another 20 minutes. Sylvia, are you there? Hello. Okay. Okay. I think I, I okay. There we go. Um, so I would like to start first by thanking the organizers of this conference and in particular Aggie for coordinating this symposium with Jack. 
Um, of course, I also have many reasons to be thankful to Jacques. Um, I think his mentorship was really meaningful to many, many students, including those like me, who arrived to his lab from sort, sort of atypical background, and in spite of that, felt really welcome from the very beginning. So um, thank you in that sense. Um, I would like to start uh, also this presentation by remembering uh, particularly his special style for setting up scientific discussions, and he usually prepared to do that in informal context. Um, usually, if it was in the lab. Sorry, please, we cannot see you. Can you switch on your camera, maybe? Oh, sorry. I don't know why. Okay. Yes, there we go. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, so if you usually would like to offer us, say, um, a cup of his favorite tea, like Japanese tea, this is something he usually really likes. Or even more often, uh, having a big dinner table for all of us in, in, in his house. Um, Jacques was very generous, and, and I think he left us in heritage not only, uh, of course, the knowledge of good wines and great food, French cheeses, uh, but also this uh, strong feeling of being part of a big family somehow, which I used to and continue appreciating. So just. Uh, short uh, personal note on that. Uh, now with the presentation, uh, I have decided to play safe and present a work that I know Jack liked, or at least he didn't disapprove at the time since I actually started it um, years ago when I was a um, PhD student at PISA. And this is Jack the day of my PhD defense actually. Um, I have assumed this study only recently in collaboration with Natalia de Olio Serrano and thanks to her actually in Padua University. Um, if I have to bet, I would say that something that Jack will really hate from this, at least at least something, <laughs> maybe many of these things, but at least uh, would be the title. Uh, he never liked long titles and my, my titles, he usually hate them. So, But here we go, a small range of medical representations of linguistic sounds in nine to ten months old infants. So a uh, previous research has shown that in fact, um, can use two different mechanisms to represent the numerosity of visual objects in such a way that small number of objects, in generally one, two, or three, can be perceived or represented in a very discrete way and precise one, uh, starting from birth and using what has been called the object file or object stacking system, whereas large number of objects, usually more than four, are discriminated also by using a rather approximate representation, which is ratio dependent and um, that it will name approximate or analog number system. This is also available at birth, but gradually increases in precision throughout development. There have been only a few studies that have investigated these discrimination capacities of numerosity in the auditory modality, and somehow surprisingly they provide different interpretations regarding the mechanisms underlying uh, the representation of small number of sounds. So the first set of studies carried out by Lipton and Fish in 2003 and 2005 with six and nine months old infants compared um, the baby's performance with small and large number of sounds. They argued for the availability of the analog representation for comparing large numerosities also in the auditory modality. Um, so in such a way that babies will, uh, for instance, be able to discriminate between eight and 12 sounds. But also, they also found that babies were not able to compare small number of items. So for instance, they could not distinguish two from three uh, sounds. And so they hypothesized that um, object-based representations that were proper of the visual system were not available to babies in the auditory modality. But then there were uh, other studies, and these studies uh, designed by the Marian women in 2009, and they proposed that babies at seven months of age could actually uh, represent small number of sounds, but not using the precise system described for the visual modality, but actually uh, the approximate one, which is, as I said before, ratio dependent. So babies were able to distinguish uh, an easy ratio of two versus four sounds, but not a more difficult one that is two versus three. So in spite of these differences, um, the studies have something in common. 
Both of them show that babies are not able to distinguish two from three tones or two from three uh, non-human sounds. And both also are incompatible with a previous study of Jacques and uh, his collaborators in Paris, showing that even from birth, infants are capable of discriminating two from three syllables. So why is it that newborns succeeded and other infants failed to discriminate these number of sounds? And this is what we wanted to test in this study. So in particular, we hypothesized that perhaps the relative number of sounds that infants can discriminate might have to do with the nature of the scene. So more specifically, building on all the, um, the theories that Marcella mentioned and also Luca mentioned about uh, that idea that uh, babies are predisposed on how to tend to speech from the early stages of development, we anticipated that more precise representations might operate over linguistic units than to uh, those previously affected for non human sound. Uh, so, in order to test this hypothesis, we tested babies in three different studies, beginning with this um, critical, say, two versus three distinction that infants were unable to uh, do in previous studies. And we tested the simulation of speech sequences, so specifically using CD syllables, controlling for teeth, intensity, and speaking rate. Um, in the first experiment. Um, the uh, paradigm was an adaptation of an eye-tracking paradigm that was initially developed by Agis Kovac uh, and Jack that they published in 2009 to study infant abilities to extract the devices. And that was later used in different studies of Jack's group. Um, the paradigm and the procedure goes as follows. There is a familiarization phase of 20 trials and a test phase of eight trials. In the first phase, infants were presented with a central visual attractor and two white screens, one on the left and one on the right side of the screen. In each trial, the babies hear either a two-syllable sequence that then um, preceded the appearance of a puppet in one side of the screen, or a three-syllable sequence that would uh, pre precede the appearance of another puppet in the other side of the screen. And these uh, trials were interleaved throughout the conversation. Um, the test trials were similar to the familiarization ones, except that after each set of syllables, there was no puppet. And so um, one thing that I want to highlight here is that in order to succeed in this test, babies need um, not only to discriminate, which is something very important in this task, so they need to discriminate two from three syllables as, as they would have to do in habituation or familiarization uh, studies, but they would also have to um, somehow uh, create these abstract categories based on the number of syllables to generalize them to a new set of syllables that they will hear during the test. And most importantly, they will have to remember the corresponding side of the screen associated to this category. And so um, the question is whether babies will be able to do all that. Uh, um, and, and so here are the results. As you can see, there are um, basically very different patterns of behavior in response to two and three syllable sequences. And these two have suggest that infants uh, succeeded at distinguishing two from three syllable sequences at least. Um, we can discuss also about um, if there is any time <laughs> at the end, um, uh, what happens with the generalization. But um, of course, uh, this, uh, the distinction between two and three syllable sequences, one could always say, that uh, is related to the duration differences of the stimuli that we use. So in the second study, we modified the sequences that we presented in the first study with an algorithm that shortened the three-syllable sequences and lengthened the two-syllable sequences so that now all the stimuli have the same duration. And we asked whether babies would be, in this case, able to discriminate the syllables during these variations. And uh, here is what happened. Basically, the, the results uh, look very similar to what we observed in the previous study. Also, in this case, infants were able to differentiate between two and three syllable sequences. And so uh, we think that duration is not the only cue that infants are using to discriminate between these two sets uh, in this task. Of course, we also wanted to know what are the limits of this capacity in babies. And in particular, whether they can deal with a larger number of syllables, and this somehow reminds me of the question of Anna before. Uh, in particular, we wanted to see if they can somehow deal with 
um, in, uh, more than three syllables, which is the limit that has been described for the object tracking system in the visual domain. And uh, so we asked if babies were able to distinguish between three uh, and four syllables. And in this case, however, uh, the results do not provide evidence that infants are uh, able to do uh, this distinction or to generalize. So this suggests a limitation that is similar to what has been observed in the visual modality. Uh, okay, so to summarize, this uh, study showed that nine to ten months old do discriminate small number of auditory objects, in particular two versus three, but only if, it's, if they are instantiated over syllables. And of course, together with previous studies, um, the whole picture suggests that the relative number of sounds that infants can discriminate may vary depending on the nature of the stimulus. As uh, infants precisely represent the morality over linguistic units, or at least uh, these representations uh, appear to more, more precise than what has been described uh, with non speech sounds. So, with that, um, I thank you for your attention and also the founders of the, uh, the project. Thank you very much, Sylvia. Now we have the very short three minute, a couple of very short three minute flash talks. And the first one is Judith. Can you share your screen, please? Unmute myself. Here we go. So. Um, okay, uh, so again, the task was to talk about something that Jacques would disapprove of study where I think he would strongly um, disapprove of the premises or the initial hypothesis, but hopefully he would actually like the results. And so this is a question, or this is a study uh, trying to answer a question about the role of prenatal experience. So actually, now you see where my question to Marcella um, before was coming from. Uh, and so um, a hypothesis that I have uh, is that prenatal experience, so precisely this uh, very filtered prosodic-like experience that babies have, might actually play an important role in, uh, in language development. So I think many of us have heard um, Jacques talk about this, and he had a very strong position to argue that experience with language really starts after birth. And so he would talk about how he had these uh, intrauterine, intrauterine recordings made in the 70s or the 80s, where all you can hear, all, all that potentially the baby could hear, uh, was the mother's um, digestive noises and heartbeat and all noise and essentially very little language. And so he would very strongly dismiss any claim about, uh, or many most claims about um, prenatal, um, prenatal learning, except for maybe something very vague, something very general, but nothing really crucial. And of course, uh, there are uh, now since then, there have been many uh, studies showing that newborns seem to know or so have learned things that they heard prenatally. And of course, we also know that potentially uh, the technology available at the time for intrauterine recordings might not um, have been uh, have been that great. Uh, so I think there is reason to believe, and this really is a, a hypothesis I'm currently pursuing, that uh, the prenatal experience uh, that is um, so strongly filtered, so it consists only of prosody, you cannot make out the individual sounds, but you can make out the general prosody, uh, is something that's uh, that's helping infants from the get-go, so uh, shaping speech perception or already before birth and then after birth, it's helping infants uh, zoom in uh, onto language structures uh, that are relevant. It cuts, cuts out or chunks speech into relevant units inside which then learning can proceed very much along the lines of the prosodic bootstrapping hypotheses and different versions that Marina, for example, and others have suggested. So. Um, we are looking into this uh, in different ways. The preliminary results I would like to share today do not directly address the prenatal issue yet, uh, but I do think that they are uh, maybe results that Jacques would have appreciated. So what we did in this particular study was to look at how very simply how newborn infants uh, respond um, 
to sentences in three different languages. Uh, French, we played them sentences, infant directed sentences uh, in French, which was these infants native language. So this is the language they heard prenatally. We also chose Spanish, which was an unfamiliar language, but rhythmically similar to French. Uh, and we also presented English to them, which was uh, uh, an unfamiliar language, but it was rhythmically uh, different from the native language. And so we just recorded um, we just recorded infants uh, EEG responses, as you can see here. And so uh, the way we were looking at this is uh, by looking at neural oscillations, uh, because the hypothesis is that uh, prenatal experience being mostly low frequency, so prosodic information, this might particularly impact uh, those neural oscillations like delta and theta that are slow, so delta being between one to three hertz or theta between four and eight hertz uh, that are prosodic or that could carry or encode prosodic information. And so uh, this is very preliminary, but what we can see here um, is uh, that uh, we find this is the uh, theta uh, band, so from four to eight hertz, uh, what we find is a strong response uh, to French and Spanish, so high power, uh, in particular in the four or five hertz band, which is the typical uh, syllabic modulation of these languages, French and Spanish. Um, whereas in the same ba uh, band for English, we don't have uh, much of a response. So, so I think the reason uh, this is interesting and the reason why Jacques might like this in particular is, of course, this seems to be um, corresponding to or might serve the neural basis of um, the rhythmic discrimination uh, of languages that, of course, constitutes a central, uh, more constituted at a certain time, a central part of Jacques' work. We are still working to find out whether this is really an impact of prenatal experience. So it could be the case that French and Spanish are responded to str so strongly because of these, experience, these infants experience with French prenatally. Or it could be the case that even say English exposed, prenatally English exposed infants respond in a similar way because this is actually a, a response, a universal response to the acoustic structure um, of the stimuli. So this is uh, still being investigated. But all in all, um, this is a, a, a project or um, a sort of line of investigation in which uh, I would like to address uh, prenatal experience and maybe a related question uh, that, that Jacques has really been interested in for a long time, namely the, the basic unit uh, of speech perception at birth or in very young infants, and in particular, whether prosodic units uh, such as syllables um, carry an important role or have an important role in this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judith. Now we move on to Juan Ma's presentation. Can you share your screen, please? Yeah. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk very, very briefly about a study that I hope that, that Jack will like, that Jack will find interesting. And, and I will tell you why uh, later. So, so the starting point of this of this study is the work by Judith Gerbein that, that you know, we all know uh, with infants and relative frequency. You know, she has shown uh, across several experiments, very interesting experiments, that actually infants can use differences in relative frequency uh, as a cue for lexical categories. You know, so basically the general idea is that frequent words, whenever infants uh, find frequent words. They process them as belonging to closest classes, you know, like uh, function words in natural languages. And whenever they find infrequent words, they process them as belonging to open classes, as content words in, in natural languages. Yeah. But the question uh, about this ability to use uh, relative frequency to create these lexical categories is what is the origin? You know, what is the origin of, uh, of this ability? So once, uh, uh, several years ago, uh, Jack said this. Jack said that discovering the origins of complex cognitive abilities, such as those involved in language learning, sometimes involves exploring the hypothesis that they may be based in general perceptual mechanisms shared with non-human animals. And in fact, uh, Jack published two papers that were pretty influential using the comparative method with tamarind monkeys. Uh, that work was in collaboration with Frank Ramy, and with Mark Hauser, and it was on the issue of, of language discrimination uh, using rhythmic cues. 
And also actually, uh, I joined his lab in Trieste, originally to work with chicken, yeah, uh, in collaboration with Giorgio Bartigara, which was kind of ironic because for those of you that knew Jack personally, uh, I am sure that you are all aware that he just hated chicken. Well, <laughs> well anyway, uh, 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 I joined the lab uh, uh, with, that, with that idea of that collaboration. So uh, together with Judith, uh, we have been following this idea of using the comparative method to explore the, the origins of, of, of cognitive abilities. And we have presented to the animals exactly the same stimuli that she has created to test uh, the infants. And just because this is a, a flash presentation, just let me tell you that what we have found so far is that in fact, the animals, the rats are pretty sensitive to frequency, yes? So they are very efficient at tracking frequency. So in that respect, they have the same sensibilities as human infants, yes? But contrary to infants, they do not use this frequency information to categorize novel items, yes? Because the work by, uh, by Judith and her collaborators has shown that they use frequency information to categorize novel items in terms of lexical categories, yeah? So we believe that, 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 that this series of experiments demonstrate uh, that we humans share with non-human animals similar perceptual sensitivities, but these similar perceptual sensitivities lead or produce different representations, different, different knowledge structures across, across different species. And there are two reasons why I think that Jack will like these kind of studies. The first one is because, again, as, as I said in the beginning, uh, he was interested in the comparative method. He thought that by studying animals, you could give uh, some information about what were the origins of, of cognitive abilities that, that humans possess. And second, because, because, because this work is just one, an example of several, several uh, examples of work that has emerged as collaboration of researchers that, that, that work together uh, in his lab. And I think it is, it is a merit of Jack that the way that he organizes his lab uh, allowed for the, for the creation of like really, really long-term uh, friendships. Yes, a lot of people uh, became very, very good friends by working in his lab and also hopefully uh, productive scientific collaborations. So thank you so much for all of you and thank you so much uh, to Jack. Thank you very much. Um, we now switch uh, to Jean-Rémy, can you, Juan oh, yeah. can you stop sharing? And Jean-Rémy, can you start sharing? Okay. Uh, all right, so in this very short uh, presentation, uh, I'd, like to, um, I'd like to argue that one fundamental aspect uh, of development is the acceleration of uh, information processing in the mind. Um, so um, first I'd like to start with a historical example to show uh, why it is uh, why speed uh, speed of diffusion of information is important. Uh, until the 15th century, books were copied manually by uh, monks, and uh, therefore books were expensive and uh, their diffusion was very limited. In fact, limited to a small elite, so knowledge was spreading uh, slowly. Then, 1450, came Gutenberg invented the inventing the uh, mobile type printing press. And now one monk, uh, when one monk could produce only one Bible, Gutenberg could produce 180 uh, Bibles. So this, uh, the, this invention accelerated the production and diffusion of knowledge. And historians think that uh, this acceleration uh, was the engine of very important phenomena such as uh, sociologic phenomena, such as the Protestant reform. So local ideas like those of Martin Luther could, uh, instead of staying local, they could spread globally and, and have a much larger impact. And as ideas spread more, they could also be integrated. And that's one of the engine of uh, the Renaissance. So um, I, uh, now coming back to the mind, uh, the mind processes a lot of information from the environment in parallel, but most of this information does not spread and has little impact on the behavior and on cognition. 
uh, only a limited amount of information is made available uh, globally. And one interesting phenomenon is that while this piece of information is processed, the rest of the sensor information decays and therefore is lost. Uh, and this is apparent in phenomena such as the attentional blink, which in adults lasts uh, around uh, 300, 500 uh, milliseconds. So uh, the hypothesis that I want to investigate, inspired by uh, the, the work of, uh, of Sid Quider and, uh, and Gislaine Duen, is that uh, that uh, the, the processing would be much slower in infants. Therefore, they should have a longer attentional blink and that should accelerate in the course of, uh, of development. So very quickly, let me show you uh, how we, we study this. So we present uh, images like this. So most of these images, as you can see, are masks, but in the, uh, within this mask, there are two faces that appear. So in each trial, there is first a face that appear in the center, and then there's a face that can appear left or right. Now, we vary the delay between the first and second phase. And uh, so it can be uh, immediately after, it can be slightly later or much, much more, much later. And we can also vary uh, the, the speed of, uh, of presentation. Uh, so on the top is what I just showed you, presenting images for 300 milliseconds. In the bottom, it's when we accelerate things. Now, uh, going uh, to the results, what we could see is that, so here you have uh, in blue, the tendency of infants to look on the side where the face did appear, and in red, the tendency to look on the incorrect side. And uh, what you can see is that uh, for five months old, we have an attentional being around 900 milliseconds, that is they don't seem to, uh, sh they don't show any evidence of seeing uh, the second face here. Um, with eight months old, if we present the same thing, they see everything, they have no problem here. But when we accelerate uh, the streams of presentation, we can see that now infants miss the faces for up to 300 milliseconds. And three-year-olds instead do see the face at 300 milliseconds, but they're going to miss it at 100 milliseconds. So this suggests that the attention are being shortened uh, with development. And uh, in fact, we, we, we went at five months from something that lasts about one second to 300 seconds uh, at eight months and 100 milliseconds at, uh, at three years. Uh, and uh, so consequences of this is that the environment is going to be sampled at a much higher frequency. And just like the acceleration uh, of the spread of knowledge due to the, to the press, uh, this acceleration can also have a huge impact on, uh, on infant's cognition. Uh, less information is lost, more information can have impact on cognition and behavior, and more information can be uh, integrated. So now would have Jacques uh, liked uh, this idea, I have unfortunately no way uh, of, of knowing. Uh, I think he would have liked it, but for sure he would have thought about it. And uh, if I was unlucky, he would have said, let's think more, just as uh, he used to say to Aggie. And uh, to me, let's think more meant uh, that uh, it's not ready. And uh, this is probably not going to end up with, a, with an experimental project. But if I was lucky, then he would say something like, why don't you present this to the group? And, uh, and, and that's, I guess, uh, one great lesson for me is that, uh, you know, sharing your ideas with um, a very critical but yet supportive uh, group of people is, is the way to make them better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, now we have arrived to the last uh, uh, planned country short contribution by Tom. jean can you stop sharing? And uh, yes. Tom, the floor is yours. Afterwards, we will announce the prize and then uh, we will have time for uh, other contributions as well. If someone wishes to share some thoughts and or ask questions, then uh, those of us who want to stay would, would stay and uh, we can continue. So Tom. Uh, I think I'm still blocked. No, we can hear you. You can hear me? Oh, my, my mic doesn't show that. Okay. So, like... Sorry, now we cannot... Now you can hear me or not? Now we can, again. What I said now... is, like many of you, I met Jacques, you cannot hear me. We, we can. Well, now... I start again. 
Like many of you, I met Jacques when I was a young graduate student. In fact, I think I was his uh, first student. Uh, he uh, had just completed, uh, was just completing his PhD at Harvard. And I was actually a second year graduate student at MIT in a mixture of linguistics and psychology. He tried to teach me a lot. I think in my, most important for him was to try to teach me to be a European, uh, to educate me in civilization and proper behavior. Uh, it didn't really work, uh, but we became uh, friends. And I want to remind you, this is 60 years ago. It's really quite incredible to me. Um, so I just want to now briefly, rather than talking about specific empirical stuff that is current, that he might like, he might not like, uh, uh, just say something that I'm sure he won't like, uh, which is to discuss uh, my view of what I think the enduring questions are in language science and cognitive science large, more, uh, more broadly. And I'll just do it very briefly, obviously, because of the time. So here are some problems that I think endure for us uh, to consider. One is the miracle of conversational comprehension. Uh, this was instantiated regularly in my conversations with Jacques, uh, because as some of you know, uh, he spoke six or seven languages, all of them romance, uh, but basically all of them Spanish. So he spoke Spanish in five or six different languages. Uh, uh, including English, uh, and understanding Jacques instantiated the miracle that I'm talking about. Acoustics, as I am speaking right now, are incredibly deficient, and yet I hope you are constructing a categorical, discrete representation of what it is that I actually intend to say in internally. Uh, this is a tremendous tool it's a tremendous phenomenon of great interest, but it's also a tool that we can use. And in my lab, we are using now as a tool to study aspects of consciousness and consciousness, how consciousness uh, emerges out of the murk uh, that we are presented. Uh, and I won't go through that more, but I have some papers. If you want to ask me, I can send them to you. Another question is whether there really is a single representation neurologically for language. Uh, or are there differences that are genetically derived uh, as a function, for example, uh, genetic variation uh, in the relationship between uh, the left and right hemispheres? And we have some consistent evidence on that for many, many years. But the larger question is indeed, uh, how universal is the neurological structure uh, we, we idealize the brain. Those of you who have worked with the brain internally uh, know that it's kind of like the liver. Uh, it adopts all kinds of different shapes and initial configurations uh, that I think we have lost you, Tom. Hello? I think we have lost Tom, but we can wait a couple of more seconds in case he's not back. Uh, then uh, we continue with, the, with the announcing the prize and we can come back uh, to him later on if he manages to come back. Can you hear Tom? No, okay. Then, um, then I will uh, I will go on with uh, with announcing uh, the the prize. So I will. Uh, I hope many students uh, have had the patience and they are still here, but they might not be here since this is an online conference and people might have things to do. But in any case, um, I I will now share my screen. Uh, yes, just a second. Yes, and um, so I want to say two words about the prize. So with this prize, what we actually, this prize was established by Jacques' former students and collaborators in the sense that they do not only came up with the idea, but they also put together the money for it from personal contributions. 
And with this, what we actually want to do, we want to honor Jacques' legacy in supporting uh, uh, and motivating students and novices in, uh, in their high risk or crazy ideas. And uh, um, yes, so um, I do not want to lengthen the, the suspense. So the jury has, uh, they were very, very, uh, very nice uh, student presentation at this conference. And it was very, very difficult to, uh, to select, but we have uh, selected two. And uh, these are the, the ones uh, which were selected by the jury and the criteria was uh, innovativeness of um, ideas or uh, the innovativeness of the study. And uh, one of them is uh, Céline Esprier, I don't know if I pronounce it correctly from uh, <clears throat> from Institute uh, Marc Janerod for Cognitive Science and CNRS from Lyon. And the second one is uh, Velisar Mania from um, University of Copenhagen. Um, congratulations. Now I will stop sharing and uh, we can check whether, I'm not sure whether the students are here, but uh, we will contact uh, them uh, um, by email, um, but if they're here, they may want to show themselves. They are here. They are here, okay. But maybe they do not wish so, or maybe they cannot, in any case. No, no, I, <clears throat> I'm here, I'm here, okay. thank you. So and congratulations, Melissa, again, just uh, Thank you very, very much. Wow. And, um, I'm also here. Thank you. Congratulations, Celine. Oh. It's very nice to see you and congratulations for very nice studies. And um, yes, also um, the BCCD would like to offer to the two students for the next uh, year free registration and an invitation to the conference dinner in case you are planning to attend. Now we can check whether, um, is Tom back? We don't know. He, he's on the chat, so he must be connected somehow. And he says is, that Jacques must be disapproving. Okay. And he must be I, <laughs> I can finish very briefly if you can put up with it. Uh, you can hear me now? Yeah, what I said was that uh, Jacques must disapproved from wherever in the cosmos he is in terms we cannot hear you so the connection to finish the point i was making which are for people like we, us what uh, we, can you understand me or not no we cannot uh, can you switch off your video maybe and just have the voice uh, okay, try that. Is that better? Wait, is that better? It won't turn off. Okay. Now it's good. Can you turn off my video? I can't turn it off. It won't turn off. There we are. So can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, well, I'll just finish up briefly. Uh, I, I share the web uh, connection here with a number of family members who are very eager to get on. Uh, so, uh, the, the basic question that I was starting on is what is language? And uh, uh, the, 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 a lot of the work that you do, that Jacques has found is issues relating to or represented in the brain. Uh, and these are very um, about. And um, I want to add more except to raise the question, which, where is the receptacle? It seems we have lost him. Can you hear us, Tom? 
but in any case, um, until we are waiting for Tom, we can come back to him uh, in a second. Um, so if someone from the audience would like to add some thoughts or share, share some ideas, uh, it would be great. Or if you have questions or comments of any kind. You can just raise your hand, you can, um, you can write in the chat or you can, uh, I guess we can, uh, the, we can unmute all of you and then you can just start talking, but maybe just raise your hand. Toby's in the chat. He says he would like to finish his talk writing in the chat. So maybe you can read it out. Can I very briefly jot in and say that if uh, Thomas Beaver wants to um, record his talk, I can edit it together with the entire workshop and then he doesn't have to type all that much. So that's a possibility. And then you can't have it now, but when I post uh, the entire the workshop to the, to the Slack channel, it's going to be there. So that's one thing I can do. Yeah, we can also try to do that, but he can also uh, try to share it in, uh, in the chat. Uh, and uh, while, uh, while we are waiting for that, I don't know if someone else, I've seen some, um, some people raising hands, but I don't see all of you. So could you, if someone would like to add a few words, could you raise your hands or? Dick Kathleen? Yes, I see you now. So um, thanks everybody for putting this together. It's really been great. Um, most of you have had experiences with Jacques as junior colleagues. And I just wanted to say something about those of us who are slightly older and the impact that he had on me in particular. So I'm sorry that Tom is off the call, but Jacques visited Rochester in the late 1990s uh, at the invitation of Tom, because of course they're longstanding colleagues. And during that, that visit, Jacques, who I had met once before at a conference in France, uh, approached me about uh, joining with him in the McDonald, what eventuated into the McDonald Foundation project that went on for about seven or eight years. And I just wanted to convey the fact that that was really a seminal event for me as a mid-career person, not as a junior person, because it dragged me out of the North American world into the larger global world. And of course, that was Jacques' perspective all along. He was very, very interested in cross-language effects and also very interested in other cultures. Um, and uh, it was really, really one of the most important events in my intellectual career to not only travel the world with Jacques, and I have lots of funny stories about traveling the world with Jacques, <laughs> um, losing, losing his wallet in the Tokyo train station and other things like that, but more importantly, his openness to ideas and his willingness to interact with people, even those he disagreed with. So um, a very, very important uh, person in my life and we miss him dearly. Thank you very much for the very nice words, Nick. Um, anyone else would like to add a couple of words, share thoughts? It's difficult to, to see you all at the same time. Yes, Yuri. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, I just wanted to express that being a historically directly related species of uh, uh, students of Tom Bever and uh, Dick Aslin later. Uh, and uh, uh, meeting Jacques first through Tom in New York, 
uh, uh, I'm first of all, I'm very sorry that I cannot find out finally what uh, is the, the real disagreement and between these two great friends like Tom and Jacques. And uh, I, I, I would urge Tom to, to run in a couple of paragraphs or make a video presentation that we will share at a uh, later occasion in the conference so that because uh, this is kind of very sad that it couldn't hear him talk. Uh, and uh, uh, the other thing is that uh, uh, my greatest experience with Jacques, if I can add an anecdote to, uh, to open up my eyes to the variety of experience uh, of serial uh, uh, input was when I arrived one day earlier to an infant methodology conference that uh, Dick and Gerge and Jacques had organized in Siena and he was already there and he took me to visit uh, all the restaurants in Siena to choose the right one. And he was always saying that these Americans, they don't understand it. They don't understand it. We have to go to the right ones. And I have never had such a beautiful experience spending a whole day with Jacques, uh, a connoisseur of enormous, uh, not only scientific, but uh, a bohemian and worldwide quality. Uh, and uh, I am, uh, uh, I followed that line. I followed that line in all my life. So uh, uh, I'm very grateful for him and I miss him very much. Thank you, Julie. Um, are there anyone else? Maybe I don't know if Dick would like to comment on this or I should that just a practical note that um, so Tom has written um, on the chat saying that he's actually writing up his position in uh, a paper that he's contributing because actually Cognition is putting out a special issue. And so Dick, Marina, Dick, um, and Cutler and myself are uh, editing this and many of you have uh, been invited to contribute. Um, so there is gonna be, I don't know Dick when uh, or Marina, but maybe in five, six months, three months, if you're lucky, um, yeah there's going to be a special issue um, in honor of Jacques. And so you can you can also read Tom's position and hopefully he will also record the video anyways. That's great. Any other thoughts or to share? Thank you, Agnes.